Chrono Trigger, a Super Nintendo RPG released in 1995 considered by many to be one of the greatest video games of all time. Read any best RPG ever list and Chrono Trigger is always there, usually taking the top spot. So in this video I'm going to replay a game considered one of the greatest video games of all time and find problems with it. So grab a cup of tea and settle in, because we're about to go on a time travelling journey from prehistory to the end of time itself. Created by a dream team of RPG experts, including the creators of Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest, the original artist from Dragon Ball, and musicians still working on major RPGs to this day, Chrono Trigger features mechanics way ahead of its time, mechanics people still rave about today. You know the old joke about how JRPGs start with you saving a cat and end with you killing God? Chrono Trigger is partly responsible for that saying. People praised Zelda Breath of the Wild for its open world nature and the ability to fight Ganon whenever you felt ready. Well, Chrono Trigger not only let you take on the final boss whenever you like, but also has 14 different endings depending on when and how you do this. Remember the buggy in the airship from Final Fantasy VII which opened up the overworld and let you explore hidden continents? Well, Chrono Trigger had that mechanic two years earlier. The time travel from Ocarina of Time, having two different versions of the overworld? How about six different time periods of the same world, from prehistory to the far future? Even Dark Souls and Elden Ring followed in Chrono Trigger's footsteps with hidden side quests for each playable character unlocking their ultimate weapons. Completely missable areas and the ability to kill vital NPCs and make your playthrough harder. And while not the first game to have looping replayable game modes, Chrono Trigger did allow you to take early earned power from one playthrough into the next and was the first game to use the term New Game Plus. Add to all this a heartfelt story about our search for meaning, overcoming childhood flaws, the allure of unlimited power and the destructive desire for vengeance. All held together with a battle system still to this day considered a gold standard in gaming and you've got one hell of an RPG. But. Games have advanced a lot since 1995 and the nostalgia goggles are thick and heavily tinted. And while many people know Chrono Trigger from those best RPG ever lists, not that many people have actually finished the entire game. So are we just collectively agreeing something is good because other people have told us it's good? Maybe we need specific examples of why it does or does not hold up today. So I've gone back and replayed it all. Every ending, every secret character, every hidden side quest, and with that complete replay, we can now answer the question, Chrono Trigger, was it actually any good? As always, a massive thank you to the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube whose support allows me to make long-form, in-depth videos like this. More information on how you can support at the end. For now, let's begin. Flashing light warning, several of the high level magical spells flash the screen with flickers of white light, I'll mention these before they happen. First off, a quick note on pixel and sprite graphics, and I touched on this phenomenon in the Castlevania video, but it's worth repeating. If you played Chrono Trigger as a kid, the gameplay on screen now probably looks sharper than you remember, and this is both a blessing and a curse. Chrono Trigger released in 1995 for the SNES and so was played on CRT monitors. Now with sprite and pixel art, a CRT monitor actually slightly diffused uses each pixel and the colors bleed together, giving a more blended, softer image. Here's an example with Dracula's face from Castlevania. Notice how on a modern monitor the single red pixel of the eye is defined and harsh, it almost seems out of place, while on an old monitor that red pixel would diffuse a red tint across its neighbors and so give a soft glow effect. The same is true with waterfalls, here's an example from Mega Man, and with depth added through implied shadows, here's some 80s dungeon crawler images on both CRT and LCD screens. The soft blend effect of a CRT monitor actually means your mind has to fill in the blanks and this creates both gentler curves and greater depth. So if what I'm playing doesn't look quite like what you remember, that's why. So while Chrono Trigger released in 1995, it's been re-released multiple times on the PlayStation 1 in 1999, the Nintendo DS in 2008, for both iOS and Android in 2011, and on Steam in 2018 where it's still available. The latter releases even contain bonus content like extra dungeons and more side quests and fully animated transition sequences. It went on to see a sequel called Radical Dreamers in 1999. 
1996, which was a Japanese text-based game which ties into a side plot. And then Chrono Cross released on the PlayStation in 1999, which itself cannibalized much of Radical Dreamers and so became the only canon sequel. A third game named Chrono Break was rumored for a while but ultimately dropped in 2003. So for this review, I'm staying classic and we'll be playing the SNES version. First off, Chrono Trigger is far shorter than most people realize. I finished the complete main storyline and all seven extra character stories in around 20 hours. The length of the game really comes from finding all 14 additional endings, but it's entirely possible if you're only focusing on the main plot to finish Chrono Trigger in a long, focused weekend. So let's play. The Swinging Pendulum is an iconic opening and sets the theme of time, and the first choice we make is battle mode, active or wait, and I'll explain the differences when we look at combat later. Now we name our main character, and I'll be keeping all the names as suggested, but important to note, the main character is called Chrono, not Chrono. This isn't just because of the five-letter naming limitation of the SNES, it's also because the story of Chrono Trigger isn't actually about Chrono as a character, it's about everyone else. And interesting fact, Chrono, just like Link from The Legend of Zelda, is a left-handed silent protagonist. In fact, his only dialogue is found in a hidden ending that I will show you later. Chrono's name is a reference to Kronos. Not Kronos, the youngest of the titans in Greek mythology, but Kronos, the personification of time in pre-Socratic philosophy. So we open with Chrono oversleeping and his mum opening the curtains to a glorious sunny day. It's the year 1000 AD and the joyful ringing of Lean's bell can be heard and they're celebrating with the millennial fair. Gameplay is top down with eight way movement, hold A to run, and in a lovely bit of attention to detail, you can just shut the curtains again. In fact, attention to small details like this is something we'll see Chrono Trigger do a lot. Chrono is told his inventor friend Luca is at the fair and so we leave the house and set off and this puts us in the overworld. Now unlike most RPGs you cannot get into random encounters or battles while in the overworld. This is strictly for travel. Chrono Trigger's approach to combat is actually somewhat novel in the RPG sense as you never have to grind. The entire journey is perfectly paced that you will always be the right level for whatever challenge the story naturally takes you to. The world map is somewhat open and doesn't stop you exploring around. You've got Xenon Bridge to the south, you can either cross it in the overworld or interact with it to enter it as a location and explore around, and you can talk to every NPC and they've always got short but useful hints about about where you should be heading. There's even the Royal Forest to the north, full of enemies, and even though you're not meant to be here yet, the game won't stop you going here. There's a great deal of early game freedom. While on the world map, you can press select to bring up an overview map, which shows there are a lot of disconnected continents that we'll reach later. And there's already some lovely color palette design going on. Houses you can interact with are green, and ones you cannot are blue. This is just a small touch, but it helps the player navigate. We head north to the Millennial Fair and talk to everyone, and this is essentially your safe training zone. You can see the central feature of Lean's Bell hanging proudly, so I walk around and then browse the menus in-game, and they're super simple with surprisingly deep customization options, including changing the background color or tech display speed while in battle. Nothing groundbreaking, just a perfectly fine system. We play some of the fair games, and this bored kid says, so what if we won a war against a wizard hundreds of years ago? And this is something I really like. The history of the world is given to you through NPCs just commenting on how they feel about the current situation, and it feels natural. As we're exploring, we bump into this running girl, and as we do, she drops something, and what you do in this moment will matter. So let's just talk about this design. When you bump into the girl, she drops an object, and this draws your attention. Your eyes will go here, and as a player, you'll think, oh, that's different, and Chrono Trigger does this a lot. Whenever your attention is drawn to something graphical or mechanical, even if only for a moment, that thing matters and will be relevant later. And it's often very subtle. You might not even realize that it caught your attention until it gets brought up later and you distinctly remember it. So being a good person, I grab the pendant and give it back to her, and she introduces herself as Marl and asks to join us exploring the fair. And we don't know anything about her, but this NPC tells us the king is rather upset that his tomboy daughter keeps running off and then adds in, he'd like to see how wild she really is. And while the game is rated kids to adults, there are some risque comments sprinkled throughout. While in a party, your companions will trail behind you, but they're purely visual and won't block you from moving. Now, while at the fair, you've got a few distractions. This young girl has lost her cat, so we find the cat and lead it back to her. Important mechanical note, unlike your companions, NPCs will block you from moving. And this is the very first floor I spot. If you stand still, sometimes an NPC will walk onto you, and when this happens, 
you will be stuck and unable to move until they walk off you. We join in this drink guzzling contest, just mash A to drink a lot and I lose, and then we learn about a war against an evil magician called Magus 400 years ago, and then I eat this lunch I find lying on a table. In the corner of the fair, you can take on Gatto, a singing robot and combat tutorial. He has metal joints, and if we beat him up, we can earn 15 silver points. Now, I'll dive into combat a bit later on, but as an overview, combat doesn't enter an instanced area or graphically unique environment like Final Fantasy VII. Instead, it happens directly within the game on the screen you currently are. With the fair explored, Marl demands some candy because she is a demanding kind of girl used to getting her own way, and we finally meet inventor Luca and her dad Tobin, and they've created the main attraction of the fair, a teleporting machine. So we give it a go. Standing on the left plate, we are teleported over to the right, and Luca is super relieved that it works. Now, wanting to join in the fun, Marl asks for a turn. However, during the teleportation process, Marl's pendant begins to interfere with it, some sort of rift is opened, and Marl is thrown through. Tabin panics, and Luca is calm and collected, and this matters because it's an early sign of how memorable and focused the character personalities are. Chrono Trigger has a party size of three, with seven total playable characters, and each character has a very specific upbringing, desire, and most importantly, flaw. And it's these flaws which make them memorable. Perfect characters are dull, but flawed characters are relatable. And what Chrono Trigger does exceptionally well is allow the characters to maintain personal goals while being part of the team and lets you as a player understand their goals and then understand where their flaws come from in relation to their goals. Marl, the girl we met in the market, is energetic, arrogant, and self-assured, but she's also far too demanding and often naive. Luca is an inventor, and she understands machines and systems, but she struggles to connect with people or emotions. And as we meet the rest of the cast, you'll see a flaw in everyone, and it's the character journey in spite of the flaws which is engaging to watch. As we meet more characters, we'll discuss their flaws, their desires, and their story arcs. That is, every character except Chrono. Chrono has no flaws because Chrono has no backstory and no defined future. Chrono has no opinions because he has no dialogue. Unlike, say, Cloud Strife from Final Fantasy VII, who has a defined backstory, a specific personality all of his own, and a reason to want to change the world the game is set in, Chrono actually exists solely as a self-insert for the player. Chrono Trigger is the story of everyone else. Chrono himself, and by extension you, are simply along for the ride, because you as a player feel the desire to help the other characters, to be the good guy. Chrono is simply a conduit for you to interact with the other characters as they interact with the world and their place in it. After the portal incident, Luca is sure that she recognizes Marl, but not sure where from, and while she's thinking, we grab the pendant and demand Luca activate the machine again. Wherever Marl is, we'll recreate the portal incident and go and rescue her. So the machine on, portal open, and we're treated to these trippy visuals as we are thrown through time and space before arriving in a forest and being attacked by monsters. So let's talk about the combat. Chrono Trigger's combat takes place on the same map. There are no random encounters. You'll often see the enemy sprites just hanging out, and when you bump into them, the fight begins. Sometimes the enemies will be hiding off screen and jump in when you trigger them, but this still isn't random because you can often predict where encounters will start by the big open spaces, or if you've played before, the encounter is always in the same space. When a fight starts, your party will run to preset positions and remain there. The enemies, however, can move around. During combat, these three bars count down to a character's go, much like the active time battle system in the Final Fantasy games, and the enemy have the same countdown, but you can't see those bars. When it's your go, you can choose a basic attack, a technical ability, or use an item. But remember that choice at the start, active battle or wait. Surely that means when your move timer is full, the game will wait for you to make a choice. Well, not quite. If you select wait mode, the game will only freeze the enemy timer and stop them moving when you are in the technical menu or the item menu. If you're not in either of these two menus, the game actually continues as normal. And at first, this seems counterintuitive to what wait mode should be, but it's actually needed because of how double and triple technical abilities work. Your basic attack just hits the enemy with your weapon, and you can hit any enemy anywhere on the screen, even if you have a melee weapon, there are no environmental obstructions. But it's the technical menu where the game really shines. The tech menu also contains magic, but for now we'll focus on tech skills. A tech attack uses up a certain amount of MP or mana, and always offers both more damage and more utility than your basic attack. Let's take Chrono's first technical attack, Cyclone. When you select it, you'll now select an enemy, and the enemy you're selecting is shown by the solid 
finger icon. But you'll notice there are other flashing finger icons on other enemies. This is because Cyclone doesn't just hit one enemy, it hits in a circular area centered on an enemy of your choice. And those flashing icons are showing what falls within the circle if you target a specific enemy as the center. Technical attacks can be single target or a circle centered on a specific enemy, sometimes a circle centered on the character, a horizontal line across the screen, a straight line from your character outwards, or every enemy on the screen. And this is where the enemy's moving matters. If you're in battle and your timer is ready, you don't need to perform an attack or a technical ability instantly. Sometimes it's tactical to wait and see if the enemy sprites all move into a better position. So then a technical can hit more of them. This is why even on wait mode, the game only waits when you're in the tech or item menu. But the true brilliance of Chrono Trigger's combat system lies in how you can combine technicals from multiple characters into double or triple attacks. For example, Chrono has Cyclone, a damaging circular spin, and Marl knows Aura, a single target heal. But if you wait for both character time bars to fill up and be ready, the tech menu of either of those characters will now have a double tech section containing Aura Whirl, which combines their turns and techs into a party-wide heal. Using a double tech counts as both characters' turns and will take MP from both characters equal to whatever base tech they are using for the combination. And late in the game with specific party builds, you unlock triple techs which do the most damage by a substantial margin. Magic, which is something you unlock later, is also found within the tech menu and counts as a tech attack but usually contains added elemental damage, which each enemy in the game is either weak to, taking double damage, indifferent to, or resistant to and heals from. Magic itself is extremely simple, and each elemental attack comes in just two versions, 1 and 2, Lightning 1 and Lightning 2, Ice 1 and Ice 2. Version 1 of any magic is single target, and version 2 is always multi-target. And you unlock version 2 at higher levels, this is nothing complicated. Now each character within Chrono Trigger is attuned to a single magical element, and each element has utility in specific battles, we'll see this later. When you finish a battle, you gain both experience, which increases your overall level, and tech points. These points are added up to unlocking the next technical attack or magic spell, and you can see your next tech and how many points you are from it in the tech menu of any character. Combining both tech and magic under the blanket term tech, each individual character will learn eight individual technical attacks. And of the seven playable characters, six of them have double techs which combine with each other. The seventh is a solo-focused character who's not really a team player. Those six characters have three double techs with every other character, for a total of 45 double techs in the game, and then there are 10 possible triple techs while Chrono is in the party, and 5 triple techs when he's not. Because while Chrono is the player's self-insert, he's not actually the protagonist of the story. This is a substantial amount of tech attacks, giving a huge amount of variety, while also being a realistic amount that a player could legitimately experience. It's not overwhelming. This double and triple tech system doesn't just apply to the player either, enemies can use it too, and often bosses or group battles will see you on the receiving end of powerful double or triple attacks. Meaning taking out key enemies in fights isn't just about killing the healer, it's often about removing the linchpin of a technical ability. The tech system also means you don't want to take your three individual strongest characters, you want to take a team with utility. And often, the whole ends up greater than the sum of its parts. Indeed, taking the character with no dual techs despite their individual strength is often a hindrance to your overall party's power. Some enemies in battle have retaliation mechanics. They will instantly hit you back out of sequence as soon as they are damaged. And later in the game, you can get an accessory that lets you do the same. And this means some enemies you are discouraged from attacking until you can kill them in one hit. Or you're cautious about using multi-target attacks because it's very easy to accidentally chain yourself into taking multiple retaliation damage attacks and not getting a chance to heal in between. I've always said that depth is better than complexity. Anyone can make something complicated, just add way too many variables and overwhelm the player, but it takes a lot of skill to create something simple and understandable with depth. And all this means combat encounters in Chrono Trigger are closer to puzzles than battles. With regular enemies being solved by just attacking and not wasting your MP, and elites and bosses needing a more refined tactical approach of specific techs. Finding a team you like in Chrono Trigger is all about finding the double and triple techs that you feel comfortable with. It's about choice and preference, and it's this choice that ties into one of the game's greatest strengths. It's pacing. 
you can beat the game with almost any party without a guide. Now, certain bosses will, of course, encourage you to use certain strategies, and you're always rewarded for having a healer, but you don't need a wiki open to beat this game. And perhaps the greatest difference between Chrono Trigger and almost any other RPG is how you don't need to grind in Chrono Trigger at all. If you just follow the main storyline and every fight that you will naturally trigger as you follow it, you'll be perfectly leveled for every boss as you encounter them. Chrono Trigger's pacing plays more like a pure story game. In fact, in the 20 hours it took me to beat the game, only about 20 minutes was spent grinding and that was just to gain money to afford copies of a special armor which would make a secret boss easier. You can also run away from non-boss fights by holding both shoulder buttons, but I never had to use this feature at all. The pacing is just so smooth. The early to mid game combat is all about damage and healing and the late game pushes into status effects like sleep, poison, confusion or chaos. And passing these late game fights is about equipping the armors or using the spells designed to counter these effects. You need a party with the correct spells to weaken the enemy for basic attacks to do much and then you've got a few gimmick fights where you attack the scenery instead of the boss but overall the combat system is super easy to grasp with the double and triple tech combinations giving it a surprising amount of depth. Combine this with exceptional pacing, every fight feels like progress through a story, not simply increasing a number. But what about the characters you don't include in your team who aren't getting experience? Well, they actually still do get experience and level at pace with you even if they're not in the party. So when you swap out team members, you're not suddenly using a weaker team, you're just using a different, equally capable team, so you're never stuck just using the guys that you've power leveled. We battle through the forest and find a power glove in a chest, so let's have a quick look at the equipment. Characters have four equipable item slots, weapon, helmet, body armor, and accessory, and of these, only the equipped weapon will have any in-game visual effect and only during combat, with swords having a different blade color and some weapons having a different shape, attack animation, or attack sound effect. Weapons increase your attack power and each character can only use one specific type of weapon. You cannot equip another character's weapon, even though two characters characters use swords, they both use different types of swords. Helmet and body armors increase your defense. Male characters can wear metal armor and female characters can wear robes. And accessories increase most stats or have unique supporting effects like reducing the MP cost of techs or increasing critical hit rate or preventing certain status effects. And some accessories combine with certain weapons but most can be equipped by anyone. This system again is focusing on depth over complexity. Four slots is pretty easy to understand but some armor has high base defense but no elemental resistance, while other armor has high elemental resistance and low base defense, or even absorption to a specific element, meaning you'll be healed from that damage and not harmed. This means while the main storyline can be completed by just focusing on really high defense, the optional hidden side bosses need more situational setups with elemental absorption or status resistance. In fact, finding specific secret helmets toward the end of the game and then using them in New Game Plus is the strategy to beat a boss that you're not meant to be able to beat and unlock a hidden ending. We fight through this canyon back to the overworld and it is dark. It's the same landmass but clearly a different time period. You'll notice the little box in the corner simply shows a question mark and these update in every time period when you learn where you actually are by talking to an NPC. So we ask around the local village about the Millennial Fair and we're told, why would we celebrate the Millennium? It's the year 600 AD. And then another NPC asks if we're going to fight Magus and his monster army. So now we know where we are and what's going on. I swing by a shop and browse the weapons and ah, here's another issue. The shop layout is mostly fine. I like how when you scroll to an item, it shows which character can use it by having their avatar do a little animation. However, here's the issue. You can see a character's current attack and defense displayed under them in white. If a shop item is worse than your current equipment, but you can equip it, that number will be grayed out, showing there's no point buying it. But if it's a better item than your current equipment, the number will be shown in bright blue. But there is no way to see what your current number is compared to the blue while it's showing the blue number. So if it shows blue 100, you don't know if you're going from 50 to 100 or 99 to 100. You can't see at a glance. The only way to see is to select a different item that character can't use and just remember the base number again. This is, however, a very minor shop UI issue, not a gameplay issue. Local chatter tells us that the missing Queen Lean has been found in the mountains that we've just come from, and if we wander south, Xenon Bridge is destroyed in this time period, and the local soldiers are holding fast against Magus's monster army. They're wishing that Sir Cyrus, a renowned knight, was with them. 
This is a lovely way of hemming the player into a smaller, more focused world using an in-universe story beat, not just an invisible wall. In the local bar, we meet this wandering adventurer, a guy called Toma. He will be relevant later, and he tells us that the last he heard, the kidnapped queen was spotted in the cathedral to the west, but it's okay, she was actually found in the mountains to the east where we came from. Having a sneaking suspicion that the person they rescued from the forest might not be the actual queen, we fight through the forest toward the royal castle. And while here, we see a bush rustling, so we investigate and get an item from it. But then there's another rustling bush, and I think, ooh, another item, but nope, this one is enemies. Which is a great early way to tell players, investigate everything, but be prepared to find risk and reward in equal measure. This route is blocked off by a mysterious box with an ancient sigil on it. This will matter. Remember this. Arrive at the castle and these soldiers rush us, but the queen arrives and says we are her friend. In fact, we are the guy who rescued her. The king even thanks us for finding the queen, but then confides in us that he's still a bit concerned because the queen doesn't seem like herself. She doesn't have her favourite coral hairpin and she never loses that. So we visit the queen in her chambers and it's not Queen Lean, it's Marl from our time. She just looks exactly like the queen from 600 AD. But while we're talking, she suddenly screams and then ceases to to exist. Now, there's no way that we're going to be able to explain this to the king, so we run, and on the way back, we bump into Luca, who's followed us through the portal. Luca then explains her theory and knows where she recognizes Marl from. Marl's real name is Nadia, and she's the current princess in our time. According to the history books, in 600 AD, Queen Lean was indeed kidnapped, but then she was saved. However, in this timeline, they saved Marl, meaning the real queen is still kidnapped, which has changed history. And with the real Queen Lean still missing, Marl was never actually born. This is shown by a nice family timeline visual. This means we need to go and save the real Queen Lean to fix the timeline and restore Marl's existence. Our only clue from the wandering adventurer Toma is the Abbey to the West. So Luca joins us and we set off. Now Luca in the party brings an exciting new mechanic. We can now see the enemy's health. And this is thanks to the accessory sight scope that Luca comes equipped with. Now, there are many RPGs where seeing an enemy's current or total health is a tactical decision you need to make, but Chrono Trigger forces you to make that choice between information or using the accessory slot for, say, a power increasing item. Now, at first, this lack of standard RPG information was jarring, but most normal enemies will go down in two or three hits, provided they're not resistant to physical damage. And bosses are more about finding the correct rhythm of damaging and healing. It's test to the pacing of the fights that not knowing the enemy's health isn't actually a major downside. Because even in group fights, you're never fighting more than six enemies at once, and keeping track of who you've attacked is actually quite easy because the fights are quite short. We've been playing the game for a while, so let's save. You can save the game at any point while on the overworld, and for saving in a gameplay area, you'll need to find these little sparkles. And when you save the game, the story chapter, in this case The Queen is Gone, is shown to the top, and this will matter for finding hidden enemies endings later. We have a nap in the inn to restore our health and notice another lovely detail which really makes the world feel real beyond your characters. After you wake up in the inn, if you just wait around for a while, an NPC comes in and makes the beds. So we journey on. The cathedral to the west is full of creepy nuns and one of my favourite video game lines, all we want is world peace or a piece of the world. We find the queen's hairpin on the floor in this cathedral and the nuns transform into the monstrous naga. And I love the inclusion of the hairpin because it's a trail of breadcrumbs which constantly reassures you Yes, you're on the right path, but through in-universe narrative connections. We fight through and unlock our first dual tech, Flame Toss, combining Luca's fire and Chrono's cyclone. And the fight ends, but Luca is ambushed by an unseen naga, and just before she's killed, she's saved by a frog with a sword who chastises Luca with lower thine guard and thou art allowing the enemy in. And that is a great character intro. Instantly, we know this frog's personality. Good guy, fantasy knight. It seems the frog is also searching for the queen, so we agree to team up, although Luca isn't too happy about this. Playing the organ unlocks a secret door, and we discover that frog is a fantastic fighter, stronger than both Chrono and Luca, and with a healing spell, fights are now a lot easier. But in a great touch, you can also access healing technical abilities from the menu outside of battle and use them to heal the party. So we fight into the evil cathedral and discover a shrine to the great and powerful Magus, leader of the monster army. Frog and Chrono's dual tech crosscut makes short work of anything, and then this lovely bit. You walk down some stairs, but they flip into a ramp trap and you slide down, and then an enemy enters the screen by sliding down a banister into the fight. 
Now, you could have easily just had the enemy fade in or jump in from off-screen with a general all-purpose animation, but no, they said, right, how can we make this enemy's entrance catered to this specific encounter? And then I realized they've done this a lot. Almost every encounter has enemies jump in from cliffs, roll down hills, or fly around trees, and the beauty of having the fights happen in the same screen that you're adventuring through means you can tailor each encounter to respect the visuals of that specific screen. And it makes every fight feel like it belongs there, in that exact place. It could only work in that place. Which again, makes you feel like you're battling through a world, not just journeying through a world, being interrupted by battles. Small touch again, if an enemy dies after you've targeted them with an attack, but before the attack has happened, you don't lose the attack, it just gets reassigned to another enemy. This can, however, be an issue later when you want to target specific enemies with certain elements and absolutely avoid certain enemies with certain other elements, lest you accidentally heal the enemy. You'll notice an interesting mechanic here too. An enemy punches and then repositions Frog. Now, during fights, there's no way to reposition your characters manually, and normally this isn't a problem because regular attacks can be aimed anywhere and Duel and Tritex don't care where your characters are. However, in very rare cases, techs which originate from a character in a straight line or an area around that character will be affected by you being repositioned. And it's a definite tactical limitation that only the enemy can reposition the player characters. Find the kidnapped Lean and she knows Frog, but then the kidnapper appears. It's the Royal Chancellor, but they're actually a shape-shifting Yakra. And this boss has a triple hit attack, but it only uses it in retaliation to being hit, so you're encouraged to use your dual techs because then you're doing big damage and only taking one retaliation instead of doing small damage and taking lots of retaliation. This combat principle will be essential when later bosses have massive retaliation damage. Kill the Yakra, save the Queen and open this chest containing the actual real Chancellor, but interesting note, you can just not open this chest and change the future in a small but tragic way. The Chancellor says they must create a criminal justice system to deal with these kind of things in the future, and this will come back to haunt us pretty soon. And the frog, while thankful the Queen is safe, leaves, ashamed of his failure to protect her. Back in the Queen's room, and Mal, or Princess Nadia, exists again, and she explains that she hides her royal heritage because she wants to adventure and explore, and people treat her differently when they know that she's royalty. Her only real desire is to be respected for what she achieves and not who she has been born as socially. Especially when the royal family and advisors don't pay any attention to her as a person, just seeing her as a position of state. So we return to teleport back to our time by going back to the original portal. Mal makes sure to tell the current king and queen to get on really well, otherwise she won't exist. The frog makes one more appearance, wishing us well and hoping we meet again sometime, and then back at the time portal, Luca explains they're actually called gates and connect one specific moment and place in time to another. And she's managed to condense her teleport machine down and make a gate key, which will let us activate them freely. Back in 1000 AD, Marl invites us to the castle to celebrate, but when we arrive, the current Chancellor is convinced that we have kidnapped the princess. And despite Marl's explanation and then screams of protest, she's completely ignored, which kind of justifies and explains her personality so far. And then we are put on trial for kidnapping the princess. And this scene is lovely. Also note the beautiful beautiful stained glass window in the background, because that will matter later. This trial is about establishing the character of Chrono as either a good or bad person, and then setting a sentence for the kidnapping of the princess. Now, the character of Chrono is judged on your past actions, mostly the order of the things you did in the Millennial Fair. Did you save the cat for the little girl? If yes, she'll come and vouch that you're a good person. Did you eat the old man's lunch? If yes, he'll come and vouch that you're not a good person. But most importantly, when you bumped into Marl, did you check on her or go and pick up the pendant first? This trial section is lovely because it really establishes that your actions, however minor you may feel they are, have weight within the game world, and your impact on other people is now coming back to help or hinder you. Many RPGs have the protagonists almost feel like post-human avatars, simply acting out an adventure with the world and the NPCs of the world, acting as a divorced backdrop, never having any real connection to your actions. But judging Chrono based on his treatment of the world and those in it this early on drives home the point of, hey, other people live here too. Your actions affect them, and they will come back to haunt you. No matter what you do here, the outcome is ultimately the same. If you've done everything right, you'll be sentenced to three days in jail. However, the Chancellor would arrive and override this choice and say that you're now being executed in three days. Unfortunately, the royal rules prevent Marl from appealing this, so we need to try and escape. There are two ways to escape jail. 
You can genuinely just sit there and do nothing for three in-game days, which takes about three real-world minutes, where Luca will bust in and save you. Or you can knock on the gate until an annoyed guard opens it to hit you and then rush out while it's open and then fight your way through the castle. And there are lots of small choices like this in the game. But for this playthrough, I'll be taking the intended complete path so I can see everything. New mechanic, these shield enemies are resistant to physical damage until they peek out, so you have to wait for them to look and then attack. Another example of how the battle system is about time and tactics and less about brute force. Up the steps and along this bridge, and this is something I have to praise Chrono Trigger for, they managed to successfully replicate a lot of camera angles and perspectives using the same sprites and the same movement mechanics. You've got the top-down map for top-down general gameplay, but then forward-facing for time travel, horizontal for this bridge, and later sideways cinematic for a bike race or even climbing up a mountain, and then above the planet itself. Even this castle escape has you climbing up the outside of a building and sneaking through dimly lit corridors. Using stealth to knock out this guard by sneaking up when they're not looking, but if you do get spotted, you just fight them normally, which is what stealth should be. We then save this guy called Fritz from the execution room, and he tells us they run a shop in town, come and see them for a reward. By now, Luca will have shown up to join you, and you'll find a document about a prototype dragon tank, which explains it's immune to fire and lightning damage, but the head is removed remarkably weak. This is another thing Chrono Trigger does often and very well. By reading notes or talking to NPCs, you'll gather mechanical information for upcoming bosses or puzzles. The game wants you to succeed, and it's left enough information lying around to support that success. Continue the escape and then meet the Dragon Tank. As the note said, it's immune to electrical damage, so normal attacks only, but the tank is made up of three parts, head, body, and wheels. The head heals the rest, so it has to die first. But now, more tactics. The wheels store energy, and if not dealt with, they will unleash that energy as a ramming attack. To disrupt the storage of energy, just attack the wheels after you've been told the wheels store energy. And when you win, there's a cool killing blow animation where Chrono jumps onto and destroys the tank. We continue the escape, and we're told to break through the guards, and this means run into them and push the NPCs back. And this is one of the few times in the game that you get the pushing past a crowd mechanic. We're cornered in the castle and the Chancellor returns with guards, but Princess Nadia, who I'll just call Marl from now on, argues on our behalf again. Unfortunately, the Chancellor and her father, the King, both ignore her, so she decides to reject her royal life and escape with us. So we flee to the forest, pursued by guards, and eventually get trapped in this small clearing. The only way out is another time gate, so we dive in and we are thrown through into a rusted metal room, with a sealed sigil door to the north and outside a desolate, destroyed, modern cityscape. Now, the time gate is still active in this room, so we could go back to our time, but the Chancellor will be waiting there to send us to jail, and then that's execution again. So this isn't ideal, but this place, wherever we are, is better than instant death. We explore the sci-fi domes dotted around the landscape and meet hungry, rag-wearing human survivors. Everyone is begging for food, and we're shown the Enotron, a health and mana refill station, but in a lovely thematic touch, the game reminds you that you are still hungry. So staying here with no food would also mean death. The people of the dome tell of another dome to the north with rumours of food, so with that as our only goal, we set off. Journeying through Lab 16 has us pass through broken down cars and traffic lights, and you've also got these fast-moving rat enemies which will steal tonics, your HP item, if they bump into you. Regular enemies now also have healers within combat, shown by these plant things, and I like how the dragon boss introduced the player to the idea of enemies heal, so kill the healing thing first, and now regular fights also have healers. Beautifully smooth way to introduce and then standardize a combat mechanic. I also like the small graphical touch of Marl's attack. She uses a crossbow and shoots if the enemy is far away, but if the enemy is close enough, she'll just run up to them and smack them. You didn't need two attack animations based on sprite distance, but they have to, and I appreciate that. Attack animation differences also goes a little deeper. You can always tell when a character is about to score a critical hit because they will approach the enemy differently. If you tell Chrono to attack, he'll just run up and slash the enemy, but on a critical hit, he won't run, he will leap at them. Meaning there's this lovely brief moment where the animation lets you know you're about to hit critical damage before the satisfyingly large number pops up. We also get our first touch of elemental tactics. These goo enemies are resistant to all non-elemental attacks, so Luca needs to handle them with the flame toss. Leaving Lab 16, 
2.15, we arrive in Aris Dome, and the people inside are amazed that we've crossed the ruins. We're told by the Elder there is food stored below, but it's guarded by a robot defense sentry, and no one is strong enough to fight past it. We're also told some guru guy lives on Death Peak, but that's not our concern right now. We head into the dome basement to try and get the food, and the computer needs a password, so we go looking for clues. The search for the password leads us over these beams and this lovely use of parallax scrolling, when the background moves quicker than the foreground, implying the depth of this dome. Guarding the food room is indeed a massive robot, the Guardian, flanked by two support bits. Now, if you hit the main body while both bits are alive, it will retaliate with a powerful Delta Wave Tri attack. And if there's one bit left when you attack the main body, it will amplify its attack against a single character. So you need to take out both bits and then damage the main body, but when they're both dead, the body will begin a countdown from 5 to 0, and then the bits will respawn. This is a combat design the game uses repeatedly to great effect, putting the boss into a vulnerable state, capitalizing on that brief moment of vulnerability, and then setting up that moment again. Because you also need to decide how much time of that moment of vulnerability to dedicate to healing your own party. With the boss down, we reach the food storage, and it's rotten. It has been for ages. There's also a dead body with a note saying, catch the rat, it knows the password. This body is also clutching something tightly, a single seed, the potential to regrow food, so we take it. It's not much, but it's all we have. We sprint along the beams and catch the rat, and it tells us to open the door, hold L and R, and then press A, and this is the first time the game breaks the fourth wall. The instructions refer to the SNES controller's buttons itself, hold both shoulder buttons and press A. Now, Chrono Trigger will break the fourth wall a few times, giving instructions which refer to the controller you're using itself, and thankfully, they've kept this reality break thematic and only use it in the sci-fi time period, and only to activate machines. So this makes some level of sense, you are literally putting a code into a machine. Unfortunately, these passwords do cause major issues when you're playing on an emulator and using a keyboard, because a keyboard won't accept three keys being pressed at the same time, so you'll need to rebind both L and R to a single keystroke in the emulator settings. And there's another password issue we'll see later in the factory. We put the password in, fight through more enemies, and find the main PC. Luca manages to figure out the system, and we watch a small video telling us we are in the year 2400. She also finds a note about a time portal in Proto-Dome to the east. Marl then presses a random button, because that's just who Marl is, and accidentally opens up a visual recording from the year 1999 titled The Day of Lavos. And we learn how the world came to be in this state. How the world ended. A massive creature erupts from inside the planet, spewing molten rock everywhere, destroying all life, reducing the world to this charred husk. With this revelation, Marl panics and Luca remains calm. The Day of Lavos, the Armageddon, happens in 1999, so her plan is to return to our time, 1000 AD, and figure out how to stop the Day of Lavos 999 years before it happens. We return to the main dome and give the seed to the survivors. Marl gives an impassioned speech about not giving up, and the Elder gives us a key for his old speeder bike, saying if we're going east to the other dome, we'll need to cross Lab 32. And Lab 32 is another mutant-infested stronghold, but eventually we find the jet bike and meet the man. This is Johnny, half man, half bike, all celebrity machine racer. Johnny challenges us to a race through the ruins, and here's another issue I have with Chrono Trigger. The race itself is a single-use mechanic. You move horizontally across the screen. You and Johnny will constantly swap places, almost as if you're connected by a rubber band. You can crash into each other to block the bounce, or use one of three temporary speed boosts to pull ahead. All that really matters is you cross the finish line first, and this just means use a single speed boost before the end, and you'll win, pretty much guaranteed. But what's my problem? Well, you're heading to the East Dome. On the world map, that means moving left to right, west to east. Even on the map, when you meet Johnny, you are exiting the right-hand side of the map, implying you are moving to the right. But when the race starts, you are moving from right to left, which is switching screen direction, and it's super jarring. And this is the first moment the journey of the game has not felt smooth. Win the race, find the Proto-Dome, and inside there's a broken robot sentry, so Luca fixes it up, and we meet R-66Y. He doesn't remember much, but he's happy to be called Robo. Unfortunately, Aristome is locked, and the unlock mechanism is in the factory to the north. 
Now, Robo tells us he can unlock this, but someone needs to stay here. So the moment it's unlocked, the switch can be activated and the door will actually be opened. I choose to have Luca stay behind as Marl has the healing spell. Robo joins our party and is an absolute tank. He can absorb a load of damage and his dual tech aura beam is a party wide heal. And then we fight some acid and alkaline enemies who, if allowed to fuse together, hit you for massive damage, which I like. It is, however, here I notice an issue with the combat system and it's only a single frame. After selecting a tech and confirming which enemy you want to use it on while in wait mode, or after an enemy retaliates, or after two enemies take their turn in immediate succession, there is a single active gameplay frame before the next input happens. And sometimes this single frame is enough to allow an enemy to move out of alignment from an area tech or disrupt the lineup of a linear tech. It's extremely rare you'll come across this because it is only a frame, but if you wait for the enemies to move into a group, then select an AOE tech, and after the selection but before the tech animation starts, there is a non-zero chance of at least one enemy in that group moving out of the area of effect. It's much easier to see this effect with fast moving enemies enemies like the ones on screen now, and it means taking your time and lining things up doesn't always go in the exact way that the game has told you it will go. Arrive at the factory and get told unfortunately it too is locked with the passcode ZABY. So we begin an adventure to decode what that means. This means fighting over conveyor belts and even through some conveyor rooms, essentially a combat endurance test as it's three battles in a row. Then we activate this crane to move some barrels and find the code ZABY means X-A-B-Y, which would phonetically be pronounced ZABY. And it also refers to the buttons on the SNES controller. Now this seems really clever, and it is, provided you're playing on a SNES, but when they released this on Steam, they didn't change this bit. You're still told the code is ZABY. Despite the fact you may be using a keyboard and not realize this refers to controller buttons, not the keys XABY, or a non SNES controller with XABY being in different positions, notably the Xbox controller. And this oversight when localizing the game from SNES to anything else has caused no end of people to take to the forums and complain about being stuck in the factory. Put the XABY code in and unlock the original door and send the factory into a haywire panic mode and we need to leave quickly. However, on the way out, we bump into Robo's old friends. Unfortunately, they see him as defective and instead of helping, they throw him to the floor and smash him to bits. And if you try and run in to help, you are pushed back and Robo himself even says, don't attack, they're my friends. And this is quite an emotional bit and eventually the mangled Robo is thrown down a trash chute and we are left to fight the defense bots. I really like how the defense bots dual tech has them pick up your character and aerial bounce you through the screen for juggle damage. After surviving the ambush, we find Robo's battered body and drag him back through the overworld to Luca who fixes him up. And Luca asks what Robo's plans are for the future. Now, he has nothing to do here, and he doesn't know what to say, simply replying, no one ever asked me that. Unsure of what to do and realizing there's not much for him to do here anymore, he joins us, hoping that by helping to stop Lavos, he might find a purpose that he can feel proud of. So all four of us pile into the new time gate and see where we end up, but instead of ending up anywhere, we arrive in a black void. Pillars of light showing various time gates on the left and then a central solitary cobbled street floating in nothingness, with an old man casually leaning under a lamp. This is the end of time. Whenever four people enter a portal together, they get sent to the end of time. This is narrative justification for the three-person party size, which is fine. The old man tells us we can use the pillars of light to travel through time to various unlocked time periods, but whatever we do, do not use the portal contained in the bucket just to the north of him, because that bucket goes to 1999, the day of Lavos. And here is a fascinating gameplay choice. You can now attempt to fight Lavos whenever you like from now on. And the ending you get in Chrono Trigger will depend on how much other stuff you've done. From minor changes like side characters being dead or alive to major changes like who rules the world. Chrono Trigger's 14 different endings start here. And you can access the first two right now. Just take the bucket teleport and lose. You'll see the day of Lavos happens, an extended cut of the magma rain, and a 3D map hosted in the sci-fi dome showing all the damaged and destroyed cities, along with the message, the future refused to change. This is the bad ending, and if you do somehow kill Lavos in the first fight, which you're not meant to be able to do, you'll get credits and a few monster sprites just hanging out. This is the goodnight dream ending. As we play through the story, I'll note every point where killing Lavos at that exact moment 
would change the ending. The End of Time also contains the door to Specchio, the Master of War, and Specchio will look different depending on your level, and as you level up, they look more powerful. Defeating Specchio in a fight unlocks the ability to use magic, and you need to defeat Specchio with every character you want to unlock magic for. They're not that hard to beat. For now, we need to go back to 1000 AD and research Larvos, and we can't go to the forest as the Chancellor is waiting to imprison us, but thankfully there is another portal in this beam of light which lands us inside a closet in Medina Village. This is a village of monsters, or mystics as they are known, and they hate humans. They are worshipping a statue of Magus, talking about the war 400 years ago, and mentioning how Magus created Larvos to use as a weapon against the humans. So there's a lead. There's also a magical glowy pyramid to the north, and we can't access this yet, but we'll come back later. And then we meet the great Ozzy, whose ancestors fought alongside Magus 400 years ago. Inside this house just south of the village, we find Melchior, a weaponsmith. He will be very important later. Journeying back to the human village takes us through the Hekran Caves. Luca and Marl gain their dual fire ice tech, and then when Hekran, the ruler of these caves, dies, he laments that Magus, who brought forth Larvos, should have killed all all humans 400 years ago. Jump into the whirlpool at the end of the Hekran Caves and get spat back out in the human village, which is the only safe way to get back here without being arrested by the Chancellor. This means we can go back to the fair and take the gate back to the end of time. And now a few new light pillars have appeared, with one of them taking us to 600 AD. 400 years ago. The Dark Ages hasn't changed too much because we've not done anything prior to this, and the locals talk about Magus's mystic army taking over Xenon Bridge to the south. There are, however, rumors that the legendary hero has reappeared, wielding the mythical Masamune sword and brandishing the hero medal, ready to defeat Magus. So we pop over to Xenon Bridge to the south, effectively hunting down Magus to kill him before he can summon Larvos, and these soldiers need rations. So we head to the castle kitchen, and the cook tells us to deliver the food and also tell his brother, the knight captain, to be careful. And I like how there are just family connections throughout the land, but they're not essential story beats, they're just realistic connections that tie places together. We pass the food on to the soldiers, restore some morale, and then fight across the bridge, and we meet Ozzy, one of Magus's commanders. In fact, the grandfather of the guy that we met in the village back in 1000 AD. Ozzy raises the dead human soldiers as skeletons and then mashes them all together into Zombor, a boss with a top half and bottom half, each with different elemental resistances. With Xenon Bridge cleared, we can talk to the locals in the southern village. We meet Toma, the wandering adventurer, again and hear tales of the legendary Masamune sword. Only this sword can defeat Magus, and only the legendary hero can wield it. And there are a few more subplots that you can start here. Talking to Fiona in her villa lets you know that her partner is missing and she has a desire to defend the woodland. And I like how this soldier in the shop says he just bought some new armor and then immediately falls over. It's not a subplot, I just thought it was quite funny. Local rumors say the legendary hero has been seen in the cursed woods, so we venture in. New mechanic, the frog enemies have super high defense, but the snake enemies will eat the frog enemies to refill their own health, so hit the snakes and let them kill the frogs for you. Deep in the cursed woods, hidden behind a bush, we find a little hovel, and inside, it's the Frog Knight from earlier. However, he assures us he is not the legendary hero, and he does not have the hero medal or the Masamune or the ability to be a hero. So he asks us respectfully, to leave him alone. More local rumors then say Magus himself has been seen in the Denodoro Mountains to the east, and at the top of the mountain, a legendary sword is also sealed in a cave. If that sword is the Masamune, it's likely that Magus is trying to get hold of it before it can be used against him, so we set off to find it. And as we arrive in the mountains, a kid in a makeshift cape runs past us, screaming, chased by a goblin. So we finish the fight encounter, and then fight our way up the mountain. Another nice touch here, some of the goblins have wooden hammers, which massively increase their offensive and defensive capabilities, but if you use Luca's fire attack, you will burn the hammer away and make them far weaker. Not a mechanical touch, but I love this little rainbow graphic on the river, just thought it was a nice visual. And this will again matter, because remember I said every time something catches your eye, it will be relevant later? This exact map is needed later for a secret. The cliff top is four consecutive battles, so I hope you healed up, and then we fight onto the waterfall itself and fall down to access some new caves and paths. And I really like how they've built in vertical design to climbing a mountain. It's not just go up, it's go up, fall down, go up, fall down, go into a cave, go around, go up more, fall down more. Lots of variety. Now there's no signs of majors, but we do eventually reach the cave at the top, and inside, a small child. The guardian of the Masamune sword itself. So we go to take the sword, but the kid is actually two kids who are ancient wind spirits called Masa and Mune. 
They agree to give us the sword on one condition. We beat them in a fight and prove that we are worthy. Now, a quick side note, many video games, mostly RPGs, have the Masamune sword. It's Sephiroth's sword in Final Fantasy VII, it's been in Castlevania, Soul Calibur, Secret of Mana, and many more. Now, Masamune is actually the name of a 13th century Japanese swordsmith, Goro Masamune, widely considered one of the greatest swordsmiths of all time. Several of his works can still be seen displayed in museums across Japan. Defeating the Masamune twins makes them say, only Cirrus made it this far before. And we've heard of Cirrus before. They were mentioned by the knights on Xenon Bridge. So it's likely that Cirrus is the legendary hero. But where is he? The Masamune kids then fusion dance into a single entity and we fight one more time, and this form stores up energy and then releases it, however Chrono's slash tech, just like the dragon tank, dissipates the energy and keeps the team safe. When you win, you are gifted the Masamune, however it's only the blade and it's broken. With this in hand, we are whisked safely down the mountain by the wind spirits, and now we need to fix this sword and find the hero. Remember the kid who ran past us crying at the base of the mountain? Well, you can find him in his house. His name is Tata, and he's crying to his dad. Tata says he found the hero medal, so he just took it and wanted people to think he was the hero. His dad is also super annoyed that he's not the hero because his dad wanted to be known as the father of the famous hero. We ask Tata where he found this hero medal, and he says, a frog dropped it. There are some new endings available already. If you challenge Larvos before you visit the mountains and Tata runs past you screaming, you'll get the legendary hero ending, where Tata is fully convinced he's genuinely the hero and will try to take on Magus single-handedly. But in this alternate timeline, the part of the protagonist hero is played by Robo in the future and Magus is replaced with Chrono, Marl, and Luca. But if you return to the frog and give him his medal back, unfortunately, he still doesn't believe anything can be done. He is not the hero. However, if you look around his house, you'll discover he does indeed have the broken hilt of the Masamune. And there's a name engraved on the hilt, Melchior. We know that name. That's the human weaponsmith from the Mystic Village in the year 1000 AD. So we return to that time via gate and go and see Melchior. He has no idea how we have found both parts of the Masamune, but says yes, he can fix the sword. However, he needs Dreamstone an ancient red stone not seen in millions of years. Another new ending, if you challenge Larvos after giving Frog the hero medal, but before traveling to the past, you'll get the unknown past showing prehistory and all of the events that you failed to change. With Melchior's need for ancient dreamstone, we can return to the end of time and one of the pillars of light takes you to 65 million BC. So we travel to prehistory. Unfortunately, the landscape has changed, and so where we materialize is just in the air, and we fall down directly into a dinosaur ambush, but then we are saved by a fearless, savage girl. This is Ayla, and she respects strength, but her flaw is that she will charge blindly into battle even against impossible odds. She believes everything can be solved with enough power. Ayla is the chieftain of the local village, and so invites us over to celebrate us arriving. The overworld also looks a bit different, but the locals do tell us the chief owns a rare red stone. Brilliant, that's probably what we need. Before we talk negotiations though, Ayla throws us a party with drinks and dancing and singing, and this is a lovely section. If you talk to Marl and Luca, they will wander around and enjoy the food. Marl even goes to do some dancing with the tribe. Ayla tells us that in this time period, all humans are at war with the Reptites, giant sentient reptiles led by Azala. And we are currently in Ioka village, and they are all fighters, unlike the cowardly Laruba village to the north who hide away in their forest base and don't fight like the cowards they are. We tell Ayla that we need the big red rock and she challenges us to a soup drinking race and this is the same mechanic as the soda guzzling challenge from earlier just mash a eventually you'll win and then fall asleep and wake up groggy and confused the next morning just like any good party good news we do indeed have the rock ayla is a woman of her word bad news the gate key used to activate portals is missing and we are now stuck in this time period until we get it back. Ayla immediately thinks that clearly the Reptites stole the key because there are Reptite tracks around the party area. So she joins us to go and hunt them down, and the Reptite footsteps lead us to the Southern Forest Maze. But when we get there, we discover it wasn't the Reptites that took the key, it was another human, someone called Kino. He has a crush on Ayla, and he was jealous that Ayla was paying attention to us and not him, so he took the key to show that he's capable. However, Kino then genuinely did get ambushed by the Reptites, and now they do actually have the key. 
Ayla scolds Kino and sends him to look after the village while she fixes this mess. Ayla herself joins our party and she is a melee beast. She is the only character who doesn't use a weapon, instead just clawing enemies with her bare hands and this will be super useful later. I also like how chests in every time period look different. Wooden in medieval, metal in the future, grass and bamboo in prehistory. It's a small graphical touch which keeps the mechanic of treasure chests but adds in the aesthetical override of specific time periods. The jungle is a load of unavoidable fights and while battling I really do appreciate just how strong the characterization is. Ayla is the opposite of Luca. Luca is physically weak but makes up for it with technology, thinking situations through calmly for the best solution, while Ayla is physically strong but refuses to even use a weapon and charges into every problem and fixes it by hitting it. So they clash physically, but Marl and Frog clash emotionally. Marl is fleeing her royal heritage because she believes she is strong and capable enough and needs to show the world what she can do by herself, while Frog is hiding from the world because he did try and show what he could do and failed. Robo wants a purpose because everything is destroyed and the next character you can potentially get, no spoilers but people who have played the game will know, has a single-minded purpose so strong it absorbs their entire life. They know exactly what they want to do and will not deviate from that path at all. So with seven playable characters, we effectively have three opposite pairs and Chrono. Chrono still acting as the player's self-insert and your drive is whatever you want it to be. So we fight into the reptile lair and take on the Megasaur. Now dinosaurs have super high physical defense, so Ayla can't really hurt them. But if you use Chrono to stun them with lightning, their defense drops sharply. Perfect teamwork. Eventually we do find Azala, leader of the Reptites, and they have our gate key, but they call their henchman Nisbel to fight us. Now you need to use lightning to stun Nisbel, however, they will retaliate by releasing stored electrical energy in a giant wave attack, so it's a trade-off. You get a brief window of damage against Nisbel, followed by a big hit against yourself. When you do take Nisbel down, we grab the gate key, return to the mountains, and leap back into the time gate, allowing us to return to Melchior with the Dreamstone. Luca and Melchior work together to fix the Masamune, and with the sword complete, we return to 600 AD and present it to Frog. With both the sword and the hero medal, surely whoever Frog is, he's ready to reclaim his mantle as the legendary hero. He must be Cirrus. But then he tells us the real story. Cirrus was indeed a brave and capable knight, going on many adventures with his timid squire Glen, even slaying the Frog King and taking the hero medal many years ago, being gifted the Masamune. But then Cirrus and Glen were sent to the mountains to take on Magus. And there, mystic commander Ozzy injured Glen, and while wounded, Glen was forced to watch as Magus killed Cirrus. With the legendary hero Cirrus dead, insult was then added to injury. Instead of killing Glenn, Magus forces him to live with this memory and his failure and transforms him into a frog. So Frog isn't the legendary hero. In fact, no one is anymore. Cirrus is dead, but with the hero medal and the Masamune, Frog agrees to join you. He may not be able to kill Lavos, but he's determined at least to avenge Cirrus by killing Magus. Two more endings have now been unlocked. If you challenge Lavos after fixing the Masamune, but before giving it to Frog, you'll get People of the Times, which is just a bunch of sprites of enemies you've not met yet hanging around together. And if you challenge Lavos after Frog joins your party, you'll get the Oath ending, where Frog leaves to challenge Magus, dispatches his henchmen, and then Frog and Magus duel on the roof of Magus's castle. It is, however, canonically unclear who actually wins this duel. With Frog in the party, make sure you return to the end of time and fight Specchio again to unlock magic for Frog, and then return to 600 AD to hunt down Magus. Rumors say that Magus has been seen in the Eastern Magical Cave, so we fight on through. More flashbacks from Glenn, who I'll just call Frog from now on. We learn that Cirrus was was always kind to Frog, even when others were cruel, and how Frog has always doubted his own abilities, knowing that he'll never be as brave or as strong as someone like Cirrus. He's lived in Cirrus's shadow his entire life, and when Cirrus was killed, the hero medal floated down the waterfall to Frog, and he's never felt worthy of inheriting it. But now, with revenge so close, Frog takes the Masamune and slices the mountain itself open to reach Magus. So we push on through the magical cave, more enemies, more of those strange sealed black boxes, and eventually we reach the castle of Magus. The castle itself is creepy as heck. 
branching paths, NPCs who just laugh and wonder aimlessly, and even a doppelganger of Queen Lean, and then Chrono's mum. Commander Ozzy eventually appears and says the other commanders, Slash and Flea, will kill them long before we reach Magus. Interesting note, the commanders Ozzy, Flea and Slash are references to the musicians Ozzy Osbourne, Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Slash from Guns N' Roses, which is why if you talk to some of the NPCs in town, they'll say, oh, those tone-deaf commanders. Battling through the castle is just super eerie because they've specifically not used any music here. It's just sound effects. And when everything has been scored amazingly so far, the lack of music is as much a stylistic choice as the inclusion of music. Magus's castle is bleak, and there's nothing bleaker than nothingness. There's even a scene where skeletons keep stabbing each other and then respawning and beg you, relieve us of this misery. So Magus is clearly one sadistic dude. The slash boss battle isn't too tough, especially with Marl casting haste and doubling your party's attack speed. However, a mechanical oddity with haste, it doubles your turn bar charge speed, but it only applies from the start of your next turn. So once hasted, you have to charge up your current attack at regular speed before the buff actually does anything. I do like how in the second phase, Slash grabs the sword from the wall, another example of something eye-catching becoming involved mechanically. And beating Slash actually gets you that sword and Chrono can use it. The path to fight Flea actually has you fight clones of other characters. They are twisted versions and revert to the monster form when you interact with them. And Flea, the boss, is another two-phase magic boss, but before you fight, the frog warns you this is no ordinary woman. Flea corrects Frog and says he's actually a guy, but then adds in, male, female, what's the difference? Power is beautiful, and I've got the power, which is interestingly progressive for 1995. What is super cool, though, is that in the actual fight, the room fades away and Flea replaces it with a magical moving star field. The flea fight is mostly competing against status effects like confusion and sleep, and when they go down, it's only Ozzy left in the way. Ozzy, however, is a coward and constantly runs away from you, forcing you to traverse moving conveyor belts and dodge falling guillotines to reach them, even speeding up the guillotine rate as you get closer. And if you do get caught, it's 50 damage, which is not insubstantial. This leads to another side-scrolling section, fighting up some stairs, and then a homage to Donkey Kong. Rolly enemies fall back and forth down the stairs, but you can climb down these short lengths of chain ladder and avoid being hit by them. Ozzy then drops us into a pit, and this is an interesting subversion. Around the room are sparkles, and we know these as the save icon, so you assume that they're always safe. But Magus's castle is never what it seems, and the sparkles are actually enemies. Now, at first, I thought that triggering a fight by abusing a mechanic that a player has always assumed is safe is a bad subversion of expectations because you would make a choice that you believe is safe that this time will kill you. However, these enemies cannot hurt you. They're not dangerous at all, and killing them will actually reward you with massive experience, which is a great way of doing it. As soon as you trigger the save point and enemies appear, the player panics, but then always survives. More stairs, and Ozzy is relentless in throwing traps at us, using chains to raise up enemies to surround us, and these juggler enemies also increase their resistance to either physical or magical attacks based on the last thing you hit them with. So you're rotating between spells and non-elemental techs or basic attacks, which is keeping the fights varied. And eventually we corner Ozzy, and in a final cowardly move, he encases himself in a magical shield. But we attack the switches behind him and drop him into one of his own pit traps. With the three commanders sorted, we now descend into the inner sanctum of Magus. Frog and Magus exchange some words. Frog reveals he has both the hero medal and the Masamune, and the legends do say that he will defeat Magus. Magus replies with the iconic line, the black wind begins to blow. Remember this, it'll be relevant later. And then we fight. Flashing light warning. The lightning two skill flashes the whole screen with white light and is used frequently throughout the entire fight. The battle with Magus is intense. He has the second level version of every spell, so hits your entire party almost every attack. He's also only vulnerable to the element that he has just used, so you're timing your attacks carefully. Thankfully, you do have some tricks. Hitting Magus with the Masamune reduces his defense temporarily, and this will matter as he has 6,666 hit points. After a 20-minute fight of healing, reviving, and attacking, Magus drops to his knees and you learn more revelations. Magus didn't create Larvos. 
he only summoned him. Larvos has lived deep within the planet, feeding on the planet's energy and absorbing it for a long time, growing more powerful year on year. And before Magus can expand on why he's summoning Larvos, another time rift surges open and drags us all through it, the party and Magus, and spits us back out in 65 million BC. Thankfully, Ayla finds us again and nurses us back to health. She asks if she can eat Frog, classic Ayla, and Frog asks if Magus, the blue-haired one, is a Around. Ayla hasn't seen anyone else. However, our chat is cut short because the northern woods are on fire. The reptites have attacked. Another interesting ending is unlocked here. If you fight Magus and lose, he'll complete the ritual, summon Larvos, and the world will end that way. Back in 65 million BC, Ayla heads to the peaceful village of Laruba to see it's been almost completely destroyed by reptites. Enraged because they didn't bother fighting back, she demands a dactyl, a flying lizard, to transport her directly to the reptite's lair so she can kill Azala and end the reptite-human war once and for all. So we join her and fight our way into the dactyl lair, find some dactyls, and now we can fly in the overworld map. Ayla is now also a member of the party permanently and can be swapped in and out at the end of time, but interestingly, if you take her to Specchio at the end of time, she cannot learn magic, because Ayla is from a time period before magic existed. The dactyl flying mechanic is similar in its transport capacity to Final Fantasy VII's buggy or airship, both letting you reach new areas. And it's interesting that Larvos is an entity within the planet similar to Genova. That's because Chrono Trigger's plot was originally put forward as a plot for Final Fantasy VII and was rejected. But while being rejected, several major story beats and mechanical aspects have been copied. We fly into the reptile's main Tyranno lair and take the fight to them, freeing human prisoners as we go. Ayla even frees the imprisoned Kino and demands he goes look after the village. The Tyranno lair is one massive puzzle with switches, hidden trapdoors, and looping paths leading back to higher levels. And eventually we find Nisbel 2, similar to the first but stronger. We fight and win. And then we reach Azala. And just so you know, there are 28 combat encounters from the start of this lair to the end. But Azala isn't alone, they are joined by the Reptite's secret weapon, the Black Tyranno. This boss fight needs you to take out Azala first and then wait for the Tyranno to count down. While they're counting down, they are vulnerable, but make sure you are braced for a big attack when they finish. I also love the pseudo 3D effect created by this teleporting rock attack. That's graphically pushing what the SNES could do. As they're a dinosaur, they're weak to lightning, and thankfully we've unlocked the Dual Tech Spire which has Frog plunge the Masamune into an enemy and then Chrono use it as a lightning rod to channel the bolt of energy through. After taking down the Black Tyranno, fire rains down from the sky. Ayla even sees a falling meteorite and says, for some reason, Larvos. We learn her tribe's words for big fire translate as Larvos. We see the comet fall to Earth and then hear the signature scream. Magus did not create Larvos. No one did. They're an entity which fell from space 65 million years ago and have been hibernating within the planet, draining the planet's life force and growing more powerful ever since. Unfortunately, we can't fight the original Larvos right now because the crater where they made landfall is empty. They've already burrowed to the planet's core. There is, however, a new time gate. There's also a new ending if you return to the end of time right now and take the bucket to fight Larvos before helping Isla beat Black Tyranno. If you do this, you'll get the Reptite ending. Reptites won the war, and now everyone is a Reptite. Back in the crater after the Larvos landfall, we head inside the Time Gate and get thrown forward to 12,000 BC, the Ice Age. The overworld is frozen, but we find a magically advanced sky bridge which throws us up into the clouds, to the magical floating kingdom of Zeal. More accurately, I suppose, a queendom, as the locals speak very highly of Queen Zeal and how she provides for all their needs with her almost unlimited magical energy. We even hear about some super powerful elemental weapons to the north hidden inside a magically sealed blue pyramid, but they're not needed anymore, not with the Queen's endless power. We explore the magically advanced libraries of 12,000 BC Zeal, and then a small blue-haired boy walks past us, lingering just long enough to say, the black wind howls, then looking at us and telling our party, one of us will die. 
What a strange yet somehow familiar child. The floating islands of Zeal are connected to the mainland by sky bridges and then land bridges, so we travel around and there are still people living on the surface known as the Earthbound. They lack magic and are therefore not worthy to live in the luxury of the sky islands. And back up in the sky, docked to the side of the islands, is a massive flying machine called the Blackbird. This is the creation of the maniacal Sir Dalton and he says we must be the ones the prophet spoke of. Are we expected here? So we explore more of Zeal, including the city of Kajar, where the locals explain they perform experiments for the queen to enhance her magical powers. And then we hear rumours of a magical sunstone sealed in a keep to the south, and then we learn about the queen's children, her daughter Sahala and her son Janus. Sahala is a magical prodigy with a kind heart, and Janus is still a young boy but shows some promise with magical skill. Check this out as well, there's an item hidden to the top right, you can see the sparkle effect on this screen, but you can't reach it. But if if you climb the steps and change screens, you can pick this item up from off screen. I've not seen that done too many times in games. We ask around and learn more about the sunstone, this magical orb of energy, but once it's used up, or if it's left alone for a long time, it becomes a moonstone. But you can recharge a moonstone back to a sunstone by leaving it in direct sunlight for millions of years. We travel up the northern mountain to the palace of Queen Zeal, trying to ask around about anything, how to get back to our own time, Larvos, any hint of what we should be doing. And the scholars tell us about the source of Queen Zeal's power. Deep in the ocean, apparently, there exists a vast energy source of unknown origins, but the Queen has constructed a giant siphoning device called the Mammon Machine, and this converts the unknown source's energy into magical potential which she uses to sustain the Kingdom of Zeal. The Mammon Machine currently resides on the Sky Islands, but it seems to be able to draw more energy when closer to the ocean. So the Queen has built a giant underwater complex known as the Ocean Palace and is moving the Mammon Machine down there. The Ocean Palace is currently being overseen by the mysterious Prophet. No one quite knows who he is. While in Zeal, we also meet three magical gurus, the wise leaders of the land, Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar. We're told that Gaspar is working on something called the Chrono Trigger, but no one quite knows what it is. Interesting side note, Melchior, Balthazar, and Caspar, with a C, not a G, are the commonly accepted historical translations for the names of the three kings who brought Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh in the Nativity Story. We also meet this lady, hiding a sapling. Apparently the Queen has told her to burn it because zeal does not need plants, but you can tell her to plant it, and if you do, you unlock a very important future side quest. We head deeper into the Palace of Zeal, and there's that strange door again. And then we meet Sahala, and we see her give a magical pendant to her younger brother Janus. And then they both mention how Mother has changed. Sahala is called away to the Ocean Palace to be with her mother, the Queen, but before she goes, she visits the Mammon Machine to charge up her pendant. And people comment that, our pendant, the one that Marl dropped when we bumped into her back in Lean Square, looks exactly like the one that Sahala gave to Janus. Which is strange, because Sahala's pendant is made out of Dreamstone, the same material the Mammon Machine itself is made from, and the material that the Masamune was fixed with. We then see Sahala use her magical pendant to open the strange runic door, so we try the same with ours, but it doesn't work. It seems ours is unpowered, but if it is somehow exactly the same pendant, we can just commune with the Mammon Machine like Sahala did, channel energy into it, and then use it to open the magical doors. And then, a random NPC confirms the theory that the Mammon Machine is indeed siphoning energy from something, a creature called Larvos. But everyone in the Sky City of Zeal is fine with this because everyone is obsessed with gaining eternal life, a gift the Queen keeps saying she will soon be able to provide. The libraries of Zeal don't seem to have any guards either as they're all too arrogant to believe they could ever be in danger, so we can simply walk right up to the Mammon Machine and charge our pendant. So with our pendant charged up, we can open the magical doors and actually go and confront the Mad Queen. She's gone insane with a desire for power and is joined in her chambers by Dalton, the creator of the Blackbird, her second in command, and the mysterious Prophet. When we break in, Dalton summons a golem to attack us and it's a very tough fight, but even when you win, the Queen uses her immense power to imprison us in a beam of light. We're left alone, but then rescued by Sahala, the Queen's daughter. Sahala explains how the three wise gurus have been lost and need to be found. But before we can fully escape, the Prophet appears. They demand to be shown how we arrived here, so we take them to the Time Gate. The Prophet then demands that we leave this time and never return, and after doing so, orders Sahala to seal up the gate behind us so we may never come back. 
which she does. This throws us back to 65 million BC in the crater. Ayla asks why Larvos isn't getting weaker if they're siphoning energy from it in the future. And then Frog reminds us about the pendant opening magical doors, and we've now got a powered up pendant, and we have a vision of a sealed magical door in the far future of 2300 AD. So it's time to use our powered up amulet to open the magical doors that we've seen before. Two new endings are available here. If you return to the end of time and take the bucket to battle Larvos right now, you get the Prophet ending. Ayla returns with you to 1000 AD, and the Prophet, whoever they are, says it doesn't matter if they're destroyed from history, they are going to try and kill Larvos. And there's also a rather awkward but funny ending. If you wait for Sahala to charge her pendant at the Mammon Machine, but you don't charge yours, and instead return to the end of time in that awkward moment, and then take the bucket to kill Larvos, you'll get the slideshow ending, which features Marl and Luca being annoyed that the game ended so abruptly, and commenting on how attractive all the men of Chrono Trigger are, saying who they'd want to date. And if you get this ending, you'll see the only two lines of dialogue that Chrono has, berating the girls for objectifying the guys. But with the power to open the sealed doors given to us from the 12,000 BC Zeal Mammon Machine and the vision leading us to 2400 AD, we return to the future and can finally go and open those sealed chests we've seen around the place, gaining some of the most powerful equipment. But be aware, there is a super hidden mechanic here if you want the best stuff. Remember those magically sealed chests? They're exactly the same as the doors, and now that you have a powered up pendant, you can open them. And these magically sealed chests exist in both 600 AD and 1000 AD. And if you open them in the past, they'll be empty in the future, which makes sense. But if you interact with them in the past and select no when asked if you want to take the item, and then travel to the future and go and interact with the same chest again, the item inside will have grown in power because you exposed it to the powered up pendant 400 years ago. And doing this gets you the upgraded version of the item. So the white vest, which absorbs 50% lightning damage, becomes the white male, absorbing 100% of lightning damage. In total through the game, there are six magically sealed chests that can't be upgraded with this trick, and six upgradable chests. Three of them we can access now, and the remaining three we'll need to come back to later. You also have the Sunken Desert side quest available to you now, if you told the woman in zeal to plant and keep the sapling. But we'll return here later too. Back in 2400, the locals tell us of a strange guru living on death peak, a mountain you can only reach by going through the sewers. And they whisper a name, Balthazar. So we fight our way through. And I love this little bit. You find a note telling you the fish in the sewers are attracted to sound and will attack anything noisy. And then this lovely bit. If you interact with the objects around the water, or with this cat, they'll make a noise, fall in or run away and meow, drawing enemies to you. But if you use the save point, activating it makes a little ding sound, which also draws enemies to you. Through the sewers, we reach the Keeper's Dome and find the preserved memories of Balthazar, the Guru of Reason from the Magical Kingdom of Zeal. We learn that he was flung through time by a disaster in Zeal and spent his life here studying Lavos. Unfortunately, knowing he had limited time before he either died or went insane, Balthazar finished his final creation and now leaves it as a gift to us. We open the sealed door and find the Epoch, a time machine. It seems Balthazar's final act was to copy his limited memory into this new construct body and have it protect the Epoch until we arrived. With access to the Epoch, we now have the ability to travel through time freely. Well, most of time. And this also allows us to return to 12,000 BC because we're not using the gates anymore. And this lets us go back to the Mammon Machine and to try and stop the disaster which scattered the Gurus of Zeal. Or you can fly around and visit different places. Or you can do what I did, which is visit lots of places and then forget where you parked the Epoch, accidentally take a time gate, and then spend an hour trying to find your time machine again. But back in 12,000 BC, we need to fulfill our promise to Sahala and try and rescue the Gurus before whatever disaster happens. The local chatter says one of the Gurus lives on the Mountain of Woe, a floating landmass above us. Unfortunately, when we arrive in 12,000 BC, the sky bridge that we use to access the floating islands is closed. Thankfully, we can still access the Mountain of Woe by climbing the massive anchor chain, tethering it to the ground below. 
This means fighting past a few more beasts and goblins, and this is a nice mechanic. These beasts retaliate when you attack them, so you want to focus on killing the goblin handler, but instead of attacking you, the goblin handler just throws stones at the beasts, which enrages them and sends them charging at you. They really have thought about variety in boss interactions. On the ascent up the mountain, you'll also meet these rubble enemies. They have no attacks and incredibly high evasion, and they also lock you out of using any techs, which means you can only use basic attacks. And if you are lucky enough to kill them, you will get a ton of experience and tech points. I like the small touch that Ayla's throw attack doesn't affect flying enemies because falling wouldn't hurt them. And then Ayla learns Charm, which is a rather powerful tech which can steal items from enemies, and in the late game, this is the best way to farm expensive equipment. I'm also noticing a clever graphical decision. The grass is animated to show how windy it is up here, but only the octagon in a few squares around the player, not the whole screen. This gives the effect of the grass being still until you walk near it, and it feels like you're looking through an obscuring cloud down onto the mountain. This also reduces the processing power required as it's not animating the whole screen and likely actually looks better because if all the grass was wafting all the time, it would actually be quite nauseating. The Mountain of Woe is, as the name suggests, a challenging slog to climb, but at the peak we find a sealed crystal. The Guru, locked in a magical prison. Guarded, unfortunately, by Giga Gaia, the protector of the mountain and source of its magical power. The Giga Gaia fight is another long one. Both hands will perform double techs one after the other, so you need to take them out fast. However, they revive rather quickly. But thanks to Chrono and Ayla's dual tech falcon hit slicing horizontally across the screen, we have the perfect attack for this fight. With Giga Gaia down, we can rescue Melchior, the guru of life, and we know him. He's the guy who fixed the Masamune in 1000 AD. Now, with the spirit of the mountain defeated, the magical energy holding the mountain of woe suspended is unfortunately weakened, and the mountain crashes crashes back down to Earth. So back with the Earthbound, Melchior explains to us that Larvos is consuming the energy of the planet, which is killing the planet, and then the Mammon Machine is simply consuming a fraction of Larvos. So while Larvos may indeed be powering Queen Zeal's machine at the moment and providing her with almost unlimited magical energy, it's ultimately all coming from the planet, and the planet will have to pay for this. While we're talking, Princess Sahala shows up and asks us to stop her mother, the Queen, and explains the Ocean Palace is now fully operational, and the Mammon Machine is about to be turned up to full capacity, which will sap so much energy from Larvos it will likely wake them up. However, Queen Zia needs Sahala there to help operate it at such powerful levels, so as long as Sahala is safe, they can't turn the machine on. Unfortunately, Dalton, the second-in-command to the Queen, shows up and kidnaps Sahala. Knowing that we need to destroy the Mammon Machine in 12,000 BC to both free Queen Zia from its insane power-hungry corruption and risk its activation waking Larvos, Melchior gives us a ruby knife forged from Dreamstone like the Mammon Machine itself. He says if we plunge the ruby knife into the Mammon Machine, it should be enough to destroy it. So with the Sky Bridge now activated again, we can return to the palace, only to be told, unfortunately, the Mammon Machine has already been moved to the Ocean Palace. And then to make things even more difficult, we run into Dalton again, who is offended the Prophet was taken to the Ocean Palace while he was left behind on guard duty. Angry that we're still alive, Dalton attacks us, and when we win, he opens a portal and teleports himself down to the Ocean Palace. We can take the same portal he just used and see the magical teleportation send us way down into the ocean, and then a cutscene showing the Queen turning the Mammon Machine on. Fighting through the Ocean Palace to reach the Mammon Machine is another long challenge. Lots of fights, lots of buttons and switches and doors, and lots of saving and restoring health and mana between battles. I do, however, love the aesthetic of both this timeline and this place. It's not just technology, it's magically influenced machines and aether, impossible connections. Remember, this is 12,000 BC, and everything is powered by magic, not electricity, so they don't need to show wires or connections. The entire culture is obsessed with immortality, and every Everything that can be done with magic instead of effort is. This fight down a lift is another endurance test, and when you reach the bottom, don't accidentally hit the switch on the side like I did, because it sparkles and it looks like a save point, but it's actually the go back up button, and you'll need to fight down again, fighting the entire enemy roster again. Eventually, we reach the inner core and face Dalton again, except this time he's brought two security golems with him, and this fight is hard. 
I actually die here a number of times, and I learned that elemental defense or absorption is better than basic defense numbers. Both of these enemies also have the death throw mechanic. When you kill them, they will let out one final attack, meaning if you land the killing blow with only a few health left, instead of being dramatic, you'll just die as well, so keep that HP high. With his golems defeated, Dalton realizes he can't risk dying before the offer of immortality kicks in, so he flees deeper into the palace. We give chase and eventually reach the beating heart of Zeal, the Mammon Machine. Queen Zeal is drawing way more power than she can handle, and Sahala is overwhelmed and unable to help. The Prophet is standing by, seemingly waiting for the process to complete, so we charge forward and plunge the Red Knife into the Mammon Machine to stop the waking of Larvos before it happens. But as we do, the spirit of Massa and Mune take control of the blade and aim it for us. The Red Knife, created by Melchior, absorbs the power of the Mammon Machine into it and becomes the legendary Masamune Blade. Unfortunately, the destruction of the Mama Machine isn't quite enough, and the burst of energy released awakens Larvos. And this fight is impossible. You're not meant to be able to win. Larvos will hit your entire party for hundreds of damage every turn. They will also cast Chaos, a status which causes you to attack your own party, which currently you have no way to defend against. But if you do somehow win this fight, you unlock the Programmer ending, where the production team congratulate you for beating a scripted death. After you're wiped out by Larvos, Sahala pleads with the Queen to stop this mad quest for power, but is struck down by her own mother. The Prophet then reveals himself to be none other than Magus, saying he survived the darkness just to kill Larvos. Magus seems to have a personal vendetta against Larvos and has been hunting it through time. Queen Zeal challenges Magus to do his best, and despite his magic and physical strength, Magus cannot hurt Larvos. With the entire party, Sahala and Magus all beaten by the awesome power of Larvos, a final attack is charged up. Larvos is going to absorb everyone's life energy. So, with his last bit of strength, Chrono crawls forward and throws himself into the attack, absorbing its full impact and erasing himself from history. Sahala capitalizes on Chrono's sacrifice and uses this brief moment to channel the final dregs of her power through her amulet and teleport your team and Magus back to the surface. We then watch as the destruction of the Mammon Machine and the Ocean Palace releases massive blasts of magical energy, ripping through the floating island of Zeal, sending them crashing down into the oceans below, which trigger massive tidal waves to flood the land. With Larvos buried under rock and water, we know we have roughly 14,000 years until the day of Larvos. Your team wakes up in one of the few remaining tents, and the surviving Earthbound are now living with the refugees of the Sky Islands, and unfortunately, with Queen Zeal and the Mammon Machine gone, the elite Sky People have lost all access to magic. A local tells us that when the Mammon Machine exploded, a strange black portal appeared and dragged in Janus, the queen's blue-haired son, and the guru Melchior, throwing them both randomly through time. One of the village elders then approaches Frog and hands over the only keepsake of Chrono that they found, the pendant. And when we exit the village, thankfully, the epoch is still safe. We ask around if anyone has seen Sahala or Chrono, but as we do, Dalton, tenacious as ever, shows up and declares himself king of this new land. He blasts us with fireballs and knocks us out, and unfortunately this means Dalton can steal the Epoch and abduct us as prisoners. And when we come to, we're in a strange metal prison room, so we have a look around, and it seems we are on the Blackbird, undamaged in the Mammon Machine's explosion. Dalton now rules this destroyed world from the air, and to really add insult to injury, he's taken all of our equipment, items, and money, so you are now defenseless. Well, almost defenseless. This entire section on the Blackbird is actually designed to be a giant stealth puzzle. You can't fight the guards, and you need to find your way off the Blackbird and back to the Epoch. This means climbing up into the ventilation system of the Blackbird, shown by this wonderfully lit crosshatch of walkways, with vents that you can peek through to see what room you're going to be dropping into to make sure it's safe, and then finding five boxes containing each character's equipped weapons and armor, your items, and your money. The peeking through vents mechanic is interesting because most people assume Metal Gear Solid 1 in 1998 was the first game to do this successfully. But no, Chrono Trigger, back in 1995. Now, escaping the Blackbird is designed to be done in a specific order. Finding the items for one character can be done with no combat because the guard guarding them is asleep, and then fighting your way to the others with one character. But 
If you have Ayla in your party at this time, she doesn't need a weapon and can just claw your way past every enemy with her bare hands. And in a nice touch, when you do find a character's equipment, it auto-equips for you. Eventually, you make it out of the body of the Blackbird and onto the wings and another mechanic. You'll constantly slide backwards off the wings here because of wind resistance. So you need to sprint against the wind and then dash sideways when you can while also dodging hazards. Eventually, you'll make it to the edge of the wing. There's no way off, but then another security golem jumps you, and this fight is actually a joke. If you do nothing here, the golem will count down from five, but then it will get nervous and count down again. And at the end of the second countdown, it will admit it's terrified of heights and run away. Unfortunately, not only has Dalton commandeered the Epoch, it seems he's added wings to it, and I really like the use of light here to represent the hangar door opening. Chrono Trigger has played around the graphical limitations of the snares really nicely to suggest a much grander experience than it can actually show. With the Epoch now being able to fly and it being our only way home, we leap from the Blackbird onto the Epoch and once again take on Dalton. This fight ends when he tries to summon one of his golems, but as it's afraid of heights, Dalton ends up getting pulled into his own summoning portal and just erased. And now the Epoch is ours again. First order of business, use the newly installed weapons to shoot down the Blackbird. With that dealt with, we now have a flying time machine, so we have access to every time period and every landmass. But before we leave, head on over to the North Cape in a final search for Chrono. And here, you'll meet Magus looking out over the bay, and he will explain the true events of the disaster of Zeal. Just before the destruction of the Mammon machine, when the Queen was at her peak of madness, the three gurus of Zeal, Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar, confronted the Queen. However, instead of listening to their advice, Queen Zeal ripped open a time portal using the power she'd gained from Lavos and scatters the gurus across time. Unfortunately, her young son Janus is also dragged in. Melchior is spat out in 1000 AD, Balthazar arrives in 2400 AD, and Gaspar arrives at the end of time. The old man standing under the lamppost is the Guru of Time, but Janus, the Queen's son, ends up in 600 AD and is found by Ozzy. The young Janus swore revenge against Larvos for corrupting his mother and destroying his homeland. Janus changed his name to Magus and worked with the mystic army with the sole purpose of resummoning Larvos simply so he could kill it. So when Larvos made landfall in 65 million BC and allowed Magus to take the gate to 12,000 BC, he assumed the guise of the Prophet, infiltrated the Ocean Palace as an adult and tried to kill Larvos again. So every time he has tried, he has failed. Magus killing Cyrus and then turning Glenn into a frog wasn't ever his main plan. It was just an unfortunate event on his quest for revenge. And now you have to make a rather substantial choice. You can fight Magus in 12,000 BC, complete Frog's story, avenge Cyrus, and cement Frog as the legendary hero while also stopping the human mystic war of 600 AD before it starts. Or... You can forgive Magus, understanding his intentions were flawed, but ultimately about saving the world, and invite him to join us in the quest to stop Lavos. Magus versus the Frog, a scared child thrown through time, hell-bent on destroying the creature which took his family and his home, and a scared child who watched his only friend and mentor coldly cut down before being transformed and left as a joke. This is the best type of writing because both characters are flawed and both have understandable motivations. Both of them are heroes in their own story. There's no right choice here. If you do fight Magus and when, you'll get to see Frog revert back to human form in the ending. But I want to show you the whole game, so we will let Magus live. Frog says he understands that revenge won't bring Cyrus back. He places the needs of the many above his own personal desire for vengeance, and Magus realizes that he cannot defeat Larvos on his own. Now, normally in games, when you unlock an enemy as a playable character, you get a powered down version of them. But not here. In a really nice touch, Magus is just as powerful as when you fought him. He has access to all the same spells, his health is just scaled down to work with yours. But there's one final problem. The Ocean Palace isn't destroyed. The power of Larvos after the massive explosion in Zeal had one final trick. Raising the magical Ocean Palace out of the sea and materializing it in the air. It hangs looming over the planet as the Black 
Omen. The Black Omen is the final dungeon, the ultimate route to Larvos, and it now appears in every time period from 12,000 BC onwards. With the residual power granting Queen Zeal effective immortality, she waits for 1999 the day of Lavos. In a nice narrative touch from this moment forward, if you travel forward in time using the Epoch, no one thinks the floating sky fortress of the Black Omen is weird because it's always just been there. Some people even worship it, just assuming it's a natural island. Now before we take on the Black Omen, return to the end of time and talk to the old man, who we now know to be Gaspar, the guru of time from Zeal. Gaspar even recognizes Magus as the young child Janus, and they share a brief chat. Gaspar is saddened by the loss of Chrono, but explains that there may be a way for us to bring him back into the timeline by changing a key event in the past. The Guru Melchior fixed the Masamune, the Guru Balthazar created the Epoch, and now the Guru Gaspar gives us the Chrono Trigger, a magical egg of pure potential. It may do something, it may do nothing. It may be the key to saving Chrono, we don't know. The only way to truly know is to speak to Balthazar, or at least his consciousness, and see what part of history we can change. So with the Chrono Trigger in our possession, we return to the future, and the creature containing Balthazar's consciousness tells us to hatch the time egg and activate the Chrono Trigger we will need to climb to the peak of Death Mountain. But if we're trying to save someone, we will also need a perfect clone of that person to make sure the timeline is not changed too much. And he mentions a magician called Beckla, who makes clones. Now, Beckler is actually hosting a sideshow back at the Millennial Fair in 1000 AD. So we return there, play games until we have enough silver points to attempt Beckler's challenge, and then play a match the movement mini game, which is actually quite fast and quite hard. And when you win, Beckler agrees to make a clone. The clone appears at Chrono's house, so we take the clone, return to the future, and fight up Death Peak. Which brings new mechanics even this far into the game. The wind pushes you down, so you have to hide behind trees when climbing up, timing your dashes up. And then in a cave, we find a small Larvos spawn, thankfully nowhere near the power of its mother. Slowly edging along this thin path, the wind effect is also here, so it's a case of run against the wind, dash sideways, repeat, and if you fall, you have to start all over again. Eventually, you fight and defeat a Larvos spawn outside, and then need to push the shell of the defeated enemy into a position to act as a ladder. And this is the only instance in the game of pushing an object to open up a new path, which is a shame. This is also the only time that we see a unique mechanical interaction between how having the fights happen on the map you're playing, and then using the remnants of the fight to unlock new areas. And I think it's a real shame that Chrono Trigger didn't explore this blending of mechanics more. If you're going to have the fights happen on the map, then have the outcome of the fight affect the map itself. Finally, we reach the peak. The Chrono Trigger activates and then shatters. Did we do it? Have we failed? Well, suddenly we're thrown back in time to the exact moment before Larvos unleashed the energy blast against Chrono. Magus cannot believe we're actually in a time stop. Apparently it's the most powerful magical thing you can possibly do. But we take full advantage of this and replace Chrono with the clone. The Chrono trigger ends, the time flow returns, and the actual Chrono is alive again. With a full team returned, you now have several choices. Every single character has a side story remaining. And they're all fleshed out, and they all tie up their loose ends. Or, you have three separate ways to take on Lavos. For now, we're going to complete everyone's side story, to unlock all the ultimate weapons, and also some armor which will be essential to surviving the onslaught of the chaos effects that Lavos has. You've also unlocked some new potential endings already. If you challenge Lavos after regaining the Epoch, but before reviving Chrono, you'll see the reunion ending. But this ending has six different variations based on how many other characters' subquests you have finished. Ultimately, the focus is on Marl growing up without Chrono and the rest of the party discussing if it's possible to bring him back, mentioning Death Peak, which is a lovely hint that after finishing the game, you could come back and try this again. With Chrono alive again, if you talk to Gaspar at the end of time, he'll mention all the quest lines you have yet to solve and hint at the time period they are in. And talking to party members in the end of time shows you a map location of where you should start looking. So it's not totally cryptic, but it does take a little bit of detective skill to fully figure out. Let's start with Ayla, who has the shortest side quest. Return to 65 million BC and Ayla's tribe claim to have some super powerful red armor, but they'll only trade it for multiple currencies all found in the hunting grounds to the north. You need to collect 10 fangs, 10 horns, 10 petals, and 10 feathers, and it takes a while to do this, but it's worth it. So we grind a little bit here until we get three sets of ruby armor. Next up is Luca. 
Remember the Kingdom of Zeal kept mentioning a sunstone, an object with immense power which, if left to die, becomes a moonstone? Well, Luca thinks that if she could gain access to a sunstone, she could probably turn it into a weapon. So we travel to 2300 AD and use the Epoch to fly to the previously unaccessible Sun Palace. And there you will find the mini-boss Son of the Sun, one of the hardest fights in the game. This Fire Guardian hits your entire team with high damage fire attacks and then a single target ultimate attack, often one hitting even the toughest of characters. But that's not all, it's a gimmick fight as well. Attacking the core directly triggers a super powerful retaliation, so instead, you need to attack one of the five smaller flames orbiting the core. And if you are lucky enough to pick the correct one, you'll do some damage. However, once you pick the correct one, you only have a few turns to hit it before the sun uses shuffle and mixes up the flames again. This fight is an endurance test of how long you can survive against incredible fire damage, but we have a sneaky advantage. Remember those ruby armors we got from Ayla's subquest? They reduce fire damage by 80%, and it was worth grinding for them because this fight, without that armor, is almost impossible. When the Son of the Sun boss dies, it loses its power and reverts back to its original moonstone form. But we already know to recharge a moonstone, just leave it in direct sunlight for millions of years. That's okay, we can do that. We take the Epoch back to 65 million BC and drop the moonstone off at the Sun Keep. We then hop forward in time to 2300 and go and pick it up again, and it's not there. Somebody has taken it. If you have Frog or Magus in your party at this point, they'll suggest you start looking around 1000 AD. And if you fly back to 1000 AD, first off, I really like how traveling in the Epoch maintains the overworld map position, but you'll also notice the Mayor's house is a lot more sparkly than it was before. We ask the mayor if he's taken the sunstone, and he denies it. However, his family explain he is a bitter, greedy man, because that's just how he was raised, that's how his family have always been. So maybe we can fix that. Let's hop over to the local shop first and buy some beef jerky for 9,900 coins. This is expensive, but very important. With the jerky in hand, go back to 600 AD. Go to the same house as the mayor, and you'll find a struggling mother trying to feed a lot of kids. She spots that you've got the beef jerky on you and offers to buy it off you for 10,000 coins. She is desperate. Now, we could make a profit, but instead of selling it, give it her for free. Your generosity astounds her, and she swears all of her children will be raised to know of this gift and be raised right. After doing this, hop back to 1000 AD, and the mayor is now a kind and loving person adored by his family because of how he was raised. And when you ask about the sunstone, he happily hands it over. Once you've got the stone, head back over to the sun keep and stick it down for another 1,300 years. Jump forward into the future to grab the fully charged up stone, and once you've got that, head back to 1000 AD and go to Luca's house. And watch Luca and her dad work together to create Luca's ultimate weapon and accessory, the Wonder Shot and the Sun Spec. The Wonder Shot does random damage, and the Sun Specs vastly increase the chance of that damage being exceptionally high. Now let's move on to Frog. While Magus still lives, Frog can still find some closure. With the Epoch available to travel across the land, we can access the Northern Continent in all time periods. And if you travel to the Northern Ruins in 1000 AD, you'll find a mad ghost guarding a keep. The ghost is immune to all damage, and the locals say the ghost has been around for about 400 years, angry that the place fell into disrepair. Many saying it's a ghost of some legendary hero who was killed during the war with Magus. So we travel back to 600 AD and ask around. The northern ruins are damaged but fixable, so we hire a local builder to fix them. Problem is, he's misplaced his tools, and there are no tools spare in 600 AD. Not a problem. Hop back to 1000 AD, ask that local builder if you can borrow his tools, and he says, yeah, that's fine. So you take them, go back to 600, and the fixing begins. Unfortunately, the place is full of skeletons, so the builders refuse to work until you have cleared the place out and then offered them even more money. And eventually, the northern castle is a bit more presentable, and in the deepest parts of the castle, we find the grave of the legendary knight, Cyrus. The ghost of Cyrus appears to us, and Frog and Cyrus have an emotional reunion, with Cyrus telling Frog how immensely proud of him he is, and how Frog has become the hero he always knew he could be. Cyrus sees that Frog is strong and capable. He asks him to look after Queen Lean, and knowing the world is in good hands, 
he can finally rest. Seeing this show of true, unselfish heroism, the Masamune Blade finally accepts Frog as the legendary hero in this timeline, and it becomes the most powerful version of itself. And I'm not going to lie, I got very emotional at this point because it's a stunningly satisfying ending to the journey of self-doubt and guilt that Frog has felt his whole life. After you've fixed up the Northern Ruins, you'll also have access to more of those black magic chests, so do the same trick. Open them in 600 AD, decline the item, hop forward to 1000 AD for the powered up version, which will give you the Valkyr, Marl's ultimate weapon. And it's kind of strange that Marl's weapon comes from Frog's mini quest, and seeing as how every other character's subquest is the route to getting their best weapon and resolving their own personal story, getting Marl's ultimate weapon from an area and a storyline not in any way connected to her is unfortunately very weak scripting. But before we close the book on Frog's story, one final super hidden secret. Characters learn single and dual techs by leveling, but triple techs are a bit more elusive. Some of them you do learn, but the best triple techs have to be unlocked by equipping certain accessories. Frog's final triple tech needs you to equip a gold rock. And the only way to find a gold rock is to have Frog lead the party, return to the mountains, and then stand around while a ninja bird throws rocks at you. And this is the only enemy who throws rocks at you, and they are on the map with the rainbow effect. Eventually, Frog will catch one of the rocks. Turns out it's the gold rock, which unlocks his final technique. With Frog Sorter, we can move on to Magus. Magus now understands that Ozzy effectively used him during the Mystic Human War of 600 AD. And because Magus never led that, that war is now being led by Ozzy and his commanders, Flea and Slash. They control a stronghold in 600 AD, so we head back there and storm in. The Flea and Slash fights are powered up versions of their earlier selves, and the journey to Ozzy is again trying to get past his cowardly traps. But I really like this moment. Ozzy summons some enemies, but then accidentally drops them into his own pits almost instantly, and the music actually dies to reflect the failure. I like this because it shows they've thought about the character's personality, the actions they'd take, the mistakes they'd make, and then used an audio cue to really reinforce that failure. Unfortunately, despite being a bit of an idiot, the final triple fight against all three is remarkably tough. Attacking them at all results in a triple tech retaliation from each one. So using a magic two spell and hitting all three means you have to eat three instant retaliations, which is often enough to kill any party. Much like the earlier Aussie fight, when you finally win, he hides inside a magic shell, and when you attack the switches on the wall, it's ultimately not even you who defeats him. A random cat wanders in, pushes the button for the pit, and then wanders out. How did a cat get here? Was that Chrono's cat? Was it the same cat that we saw in the futuristic sewers? How is Chrono's cat in 600 AD? In fact, how is it everywhere? With Ozzy sorted, Magus can find his ultimate equipment, the Gloom Set, in a hidden room just south of the boss room. The Gloom Scythe does more damage the more party members are dead, really reinforcing Magus's solo-focused battle style. Interesting side note, if you finish Magus's side quest and do defeat Ozzy in this time period, when you travel forward to 1000 AD, the Human Monster War finished quite quickly, and all the monsters now are actually super chill and get on pretty well with all the humans. With Magus sorted, we can now move on to helping Fiona, who isn't a playable character, but does tie into Robo and Luca's storylines. Remember the woman in 12,000 BC Zeal with the sapling? Queen Zeal told her to destroy it and we told her to plant it. Well, in 600 AD, her descendant Fiona still has that sapling. And Fiona wants to plant it to revive the desert into a forest, but the desert is full of monsters, so we go and sort that out. This means falling into the whirling sand and clearing out the skeletons below. And the idea of an optional super boss hiding in the desert also draws parallels to Ruby Weapon in Final Fantasy VII. The desert boss hides underground and only pops up every few seconds, and you must run up to it to start the fight. However, you're also on this conveyor belt of moving sand dunes, so movement is quite hindered. You don't get any sort of bonus for starting the fight in any specific corner of the room, and one thing to note about all these optional bosses is they are incredibly hard. If you take your turns too slow, or use the wrong spell at the wrong time, and make more than one or two mistakes during these fights, and they're about 20 minutes each, you will be killed. You're dealing with much higher damage numbers, and set 
setting up your armor to absorb the correct element is essential to surviving. This desert boss has a super high defense unless you use water or ice magic which hardens the sand of the skeletal body and reduces their defense. With the desert cleared of enemies, we tell Fiona it's safe to plant the seed. Unfortunately, regrowing a forest takes hundreds of years and she doesn't have the family or the help to maintain a vigil for several centuries. Thankfully, Robo is willing to stay behind and tend the forest from now until it's finished. If you agree to this, you'll now see Robo in the overworld tilling the ground. He finally found his purpose, not in machines or destruction, but in nature and regrowth. And if you jump forward to 1000 AD, the desert is now a lush forest, and just on the edge of that forest, there is a church built to honor Fiona and Robo, the saviors of nature. Reactivating Robo within this church takes some time because he's been working non-stop for 400 years, but he does remember us like it was yesterday and happily rejoins us. This leads to a campfire scene where everyone is enjoying the forest at night, and Robo theorizes the time gates may not even be a creation of Larvos, but instead another entity who simply wishes us to witness the events of time. This then leads to one of the darker moments of Chrono Trigger, one of the few events you cannot return to in time and try again. While everyone is asleep, Luca wakes up. She opens a red time portal and travels back to 990 AD, 10 years ago, to the night she wishes she could change. We've seen Luca's dad, Tobin, before, but never Luca's mum, Lara. And this is why. When Luca was a child, her father Tobin was obsessed with inventions and science, so much so that he ignored Luca. This made Luca resent science, and she saw it as stealing her father away from her. Then one day, she sees her mum clean one of the dad's inventions, get her skirt caught in a moving part, and dragged into the machine. Lara is screaming for Luca to do something, to turn off the machine, to help her, but Luca is just a child and doesn't know what to do. She can only watch helplessly as the machine rips through her mum's legs, leaving her disabled. Luca, despite being a child, blames herself for not being able to save her mum from this machine. And through her diary notes, you discover that Luca only became an inventor so she would know enough about machines to save someone if this ever happens again. If only I knew more, she writes. So this Red Gate, taken alone while the rest of the party sleeps, is Luca's chance to set things right as an adult. By reading Tobin's diary, you discover the shut-off password to the machine is his wife's name, Lara, or L-A-R-A -A, on the controller. However, an additional challenge compared to the previous passwords, you only have about four seconds to put this code in. It is a super quick moment, and if you're able to do it, the machine stops and you save your mum. Doing this causes Tobin to spend more time with Luca and pass the passion for inventing onto her. So Luca now grows up loving machines instead of feeling indebted to learn it. When you return to the campfire, whether you're able to save Luca's mum or not, Robo greets you and gives you a gift, the green dream. It's a piece of amber from the forest forged inside him under immense pressure for 400 years. This is an equipable accessory which revives you once during battle. And now we know Luca's backstory. We begin to see that every character in Chrono Trigger is following a life created by a childhood issue, which slowly solidifies into a personality, and then they get the chance to face that issue head on and find closure, becoming who they actually want to be. With the forest regrown, we have more to explore with Robo, mainly why the robots in the far future began to attack him, or why the computer system is now so hostile to humans. So with the epoch flying, we can return to the original robot factory, to Geno Dome, and search out some answers. To complete Robo's side quest, you must have Robo positioned in the top slot of the party and act as the leader. When you enter the factory, another robot greets Robo and you learn his real name, Prometheus. This is apt, as Robo is effectively named after the god who defied Olympus and brought fire to the humans, in this case in the form of technology. The robot factory itself is a large multi-floor puzzle with various switches and doors and another new mechanic. Walking into this indent will charge Robo with electrical energy, and this only lasts a short time and needs to be taken to the other doors to open them. This means sprinting quickly through the level to access new parts, and eventually we discover the secret and truth of the factory. The few remaining humans in this time period are being processed into fuel to continue powering the facility. To shut this down, we need to reach the mainframe, or as Robo calls it, Mother. The timings needed to take the electrical discharge from one station to the next are super tight, and a large part of this factory is a puzzle in reversing the direction of this conveyor belt to make the run possible. Eventually, when you push through, you bump into Robo's old girlfriend. Robo's girlfriend is called Atropos, which continues the mythical nature of Robo's side quest. With Robo himself being Prometheus and his girlfriend Atropos, the name Atropos is one of the three sisters of fate in Greek mythology, specifically the sister of fate who would cut the thread of life and decide how 
how and when someone dies. And she congratulates him, stating his purpose was always to infiltrate human society, learn from it, and destroy it from within. And while Robo doesn't deny that this was his original purpose, he insists he is no longer under the control of Mother and cannot believe this is what has become of both his time and his kin. This leads to one of the first one-on-one -on -one showdown fights, where Robo must fight his old girlfriend before she kills his human friends. You both have the same moveset, but Robo is slightly stronger, so keep punching until she breaks, and then, in a rather emotional moment, destroying Robo's girlfriend gives her a moment of lucidity, of memories before Mother rewrote their programming, and she misses Robo dearly giving him her bow, which is a permanent upgrade to Robo. In the center of the facility, you can confront Mother, who explains that after Larvos destroyed the world, humans had no chance. Larvos absorbs all organic energy as fuel, and the greater variety within the organic energy available, the stronger Larvos becomes. So the only logical solution was for machines to be made, humans to be processed, and Larvos to be left to slowly die with nothing to eat. The irony here is Mother may be cruel, but she's not wrong. Starving Larvos is a legit legitimate solution, but doing this requires the extermination of the human race and Robo cannot abide that. So you fight. Mother is flanked by three support screens, and these will heal her for around a thousand health per turn, so the temptation is definitely kill them quickly, but be careful to only take out two. If you leave one alive, you can just focus on out damaging the healing, but if you break all three screens, Mother will go haywire and hit faster and harder every turn, which is much harder to beat. When you take Mother down, all the factory shuts down and the robots everywhere will stop, and the humans now have a chance to begin rebuilding the world again. This also gets you Robo's ultimate weapon, the Terror Arm. On to Marl's subquest, reconciling with her father, or more correctly, helping the adults in the castle see that she is a capable adult in her own right. If you return to Guardia Castle in the present, 1000 AD, remember, some people still want you for kidnapping, the Chancellor tells Marl that her mum's death was definitely her father's fault. He was neglectful and harsh, spending too much time working to maintain the treasury of Guardia to really pay attention to either of them. Marl screams at her dad, her dad screams back, and the two hate each other even more. There's actually nothing you can do to fix their relationship here, so we return to 600 AD to set some new events in motion. The Guardia royal family in 600 AD seems obsessed with finding the mythical rainbow shell, a huge shell made of magical and tough material. Owning this would support the royal coffers and reduce the workload on the royal family. They wouldn't need to maintain the nation's wealth if they had such a national treasure. Now, we've actually heard of the rainbow shell before. The wandering adventurer Toma has been looking for it and mentioned it several times. And if you pop over to the inn on the northern island next to the ruins that Frog's subquest takes place in, you can meet Toma again. He's having a drink before starting the search for the shell. He even gives you a can of soda and says if he doesn't find the shell, make sure to pour the soda over his grave in respect for him trying. And if you then jump forward 400 years, you can find Toma's grave on the western cape of the same landmass. And if you do pour the exact drink over it, Toma's ghost will explain he never found the shell, but he did find where he thinks it is hidden, within the giant's claw cavern to the west. Unfortunately, this cavern doesn't exist in 1000 AD. That's not a problem. If we return to 600 AD, the cavern is now open and you can begin exploring. You might notice, however, the place looks familiar, because Giant's Claw Cavern is actually the Tyranno Lair from 65 million BC, except millions of years have eroded the cave walls. So while you have to avoid pitfalls the last time you went through this to get to the end, you now need to activate the pitfalls on purpose just to descend deeper into the lair. And I love the fact that while they have reused a location, they've reused it in a way where progression requires the opposite focus to before. We fight through an absolute ton of bats and dinosaurs and find the Frenzy Band, an accessory which, when equipped, has an 80% chance to trigger a counterattack when you get hit. Stick this on Ayla and you're good to go. Finally, in the depth of the lair, we find the Rust Tyranno. The ancient black Tyranno we defeated millions of years ago is still alive and is much tougher. Taking it down this time is, however, a bit easier as we have access to brutally powerful triple techs. With the Rust Tyranno down, we finally find the rainbow shell, but it's far too heavy to move, even with all three of us, so we report this discovery to the king, and he agrees to send a regiment of soldiers to bring the shell to the castle and keep it safe as a national treasure. With this done, we return to 1000 AD to see how the king has changed. Unfortunately, he hasn't. He still seems work focused and still sees Marl as a child. And unfortunately, he's also now on trial. The king is being accused by his own chancellor of selling the rainbow shell, a national treasure 
to fill his own pockets. The only issue is the king doesn't know what the rainbow shell is, so clearly knowledge of this discovery was lost over 400 years ago, or it was kept from him. Knowing that we can prove the king's innocence by finding the rainbow shell in the castle basement, we rush down and are attacked by Nagas, the same enemies from the cathedral at the start. Eventually we find the shell and a letter from Queen Lean of 600 AD to Marl of 1000 AD. Lean explains that she knows Marl and her father may not get on because their family line never has, but the bond they have is stronger than she knows. Marl, realizing that her dad needs her help, finds the strength to make herself heard. She snaps off a small part of the rainbow shell as proof that we have it and returns to the courtroom. However, the guards refuse to let her in, so she sneaks around the back and in a dramatic, fantastic entrance, leaps up and smashes through the stained glass window. Before anyone can object, Marl presents proof that the shell is in the castle and her father is being framed, and with this revelation, the Chancellor reveals his true form. He is Yakra the 13th, a descendant of the original Yakra who kidnapped Queen Lean all those years ago. The original Yakra who also posed as a Chancellor, the ones that we fought in the church. 400 years later, his descendant is here to avenge his ancestor. I honestly really like this callback, because it shows that while no one was listening to Marl and everyone was listening to the Chancellor every time, the Chancellor was the one lying to them. It's showing that just because somebody is in a position of power does not mean that they have your best interest at heart. This battle is much harder than before, but when you finally win, Marl and the King make up. The King understands that Marl isn't a child anymore and needs to choose her own path, and Marl understands that her father didn't neglect the family as she was taught, they were all being fed lies from the Chancellor meant to disrupt the family. And as this happens, Melchior, the guru of life and smith of the Masamune, appears again, saying he heard about the rainbow shell and believes he could fashion it into a powerful weapon. A little note here, you can return to the courtroom, pick up the key that Yakra the 13th dropped, and then free the current chancellor from a chest, meaning we've now freed two chancellors from two chests in two time periods. Melchior is in the basement and can indeed fashion the shell into a weapon, or he can make three helmets. And the prism helms that he makes prevent the chaos status and will be be essential for surviving Lavos, so I go for those. But he also has one final gift. If you've completed Lucas' side quest and found the Sunstone, Melchior can now combine the Sunstone and the Rainbow Shell into Rainbow, Chrono's ultimate weapon. The only thing remaining if you really want to be a completionist is to access the magical sealed blue pyramid in 1000 AD and use the power of the pendant to unlock it. You can choose either a helmet or a sword for Chrono, but neither are better than what you now have. And with that, every single side quest is done. The only thing left to do is kill Larvos, but you now have three possible ways to do that. The main ending and the route to unlocking New Game Plus requires us to complete the Black Omen, take on Queen Zeal, and then kill Larvos. But you could also just take the Bucket Teleport from the end of time to the day of Larvos and skip the Black Omen entirely, or you can use the Epoch to fly to 1999, the day of Larvos, and then crash the Epoch into Larvos, which instantly kills his first nine forms and lets you go and fight his two ultimate forms first. And yes, you did hear correctly, Larvos has 11 forms. But we're being thorough, so we jump into the Epoch, return to 12,000 BC, and enter the Black Omen. Remember, this is the Risen Ocean Palace. You can actually enter the Omen at any time period after 12,000 BC, but if you try the far future, the Queen informs you that you're too late and have already lost. By now, you've unlocked almost all the endings, which all have minor variations on who appears in the final credit sequence and whether the Epoch ship is destroyed or not. So let's take on the final dungeon, the Black Omen. This is an endurance test, a two and a half hour gauntlet of 11 different bosses leading to a fight against 11 forms of Larvos. The Mega Mutant greets us and tries to cast Chaos, but the Prison Helms from the Rainbow Shell Marl subquest protect us. The Lift Fight has us take on two advanced forms of Gatto, the training bot from earlier, and I love how these enemies, which look like a blob and an alien, are actually called Blob and Alien. The Black Omen is a beautiful, brutal place. The Giga Mutant is only vulnerable to magic, and its big brother, the Terror Mutant, has its top half drain HP from its bottom half, so only ever attack the top. Powered up Larvos spawn then gets teleported into the room to try and stop us, and then finally we reach the central core, 
cloning vats of us surrounding the room. It seems that Queen Zeal also understands that she can manipulate the events of the past through the use of clones, so she is preparing to erase us from history. Queen Zeal has survived the explosion because of the residual power of Lavos, and the fight against the Queen opens with her draining everyone's HP to one, so I hope you've brought group heals. I've gone with Chrono, Frog, and Ayla for Chrono's Luminaire AoE tech attack and Frog and Ayla's joint Slurp Kiss team heal, and then Ayla's brutal physical damage and the combined triple tech of 3D attack, which hits for massive physical damage. When you weaken the Queen enough, she decides to just overwhelm us with magical energy and throws us into the aura of the damaged Mammon machine itself. Fighting the broken Mammon machine is a puzzle, because damaging it at all increases its offense and defense, but hitting it with Frog's Masamune, because the Masamune is the original blade which damaged it, drains all of the buffs. The Mammon machine stores energy, then releases it as waves of damage, but when you finally break it, Queen Zeal will teleport you onto the roof of the Black Omen itself, and as you gaze onto the planet below, she will reveal her true form. A floating golden mask with two magical hands. Attacking the hands is a bad idea as they'll retaliate, so just stay healed and throw as much damage as you can, as fast as you can, onto the mask. This form has got some amazing visual spells that you've not seen before, and some beautiful new animations. It's like they kept the trippy visuals to a gentle 7 out of 10 for the whole game, but then ramp it up to 10 for the final hour, making this whole section feel super intense. When you take the queen down, she realizes she cannot win, so for a final act of cruelty, she uses the last of her power to forcefully throw us through time to 1999, the day of Lavos, leaving us no choice but to fight this alien thing. And so begins the final hour of constant battles. The Lavos mouth and shell will cycle through nine forms, all matching the mechanics of bosses you fought previously. Thankfully, it does show you a gentle fade-in of what boss version you're about to fight. And if those bosses had multiple sections you can attack, small alien tentacles or growths will sprout from Lavos and act as those parts. So you need to take on the dragon tank from the bridge escape, and you have to remember, kill the head first. Then you fight the Guardian from Food Storage in 2300, Hekran from the Cave Systems, Zombor from Xenon Bridge, the Masamune combined from the Cave Top, Nisbel from the Dinosaur Caves, Magus from the original summoning attempt, the Black Tyranno from the Reptite Lair, and then Giga Gaia from the summit of the Mountain of Woe. And when the ninth form finally dies, you hear that trademark scream. <laughs> But we're not finished. All we've done is broken the shell. Now we head inside the creature itself to fight the actual form of Lavos. The first form is a construct body housing a creature of pure despair, which opens the fight in the traditional way of nipple laser cannons. This form has a main body and two arms, and the arms will heal the body and each other, so you need to take them both out at the same time. However, they have different total hit points. And this was done so you can't just balance the damage against each arm. You need to do slightly more to one of them. But eventually you'll take both arms out and be able to destroy the central body, and then we find that was another shell, and inside is the creature itself. This is Lavos. No, not the middle thing. That thing on the right. That tiny floating organic blob. That is the creature. And as we fight, the mental aura of anguish floods into your team and you realize the horrible truth. Lavos absorbs organic matter as energy and has been guiding the planet simply to produce food for itself. Reptites, humans, Zeal, the Kingdom of Guardia, Lavos needs a variety of DNA to survive, so its entire existence has been about cultivating this planet as a varied, balanced meal. The fight against Lavos is visually gorgeous, it's stunningly well scored and mechanically varied. The trippy pattern behind you will fade in and out of all the time periods you've visited before, and Lavos's attack patterns will change based on where in time you are. The left floating bit always heals the other two, so take that out first, and the central body retaliates and is only there to trick you into attacking it. But the right bit, the essence of Lavos itself, is resistant to almost everything, so this is a long fight. Lavos throws the most most powerful attacks at you, including the Grand Stone attack, which creates this almost 3D illusion of a boulder being dropped on the party. Great use of blending there. And after a grueling 35-minute fight against so many forms and so many attacks, almost dying so many times, and after doing 30,000 damage to the right bit, Lavos finally dies. And that leads to Chrono waking up in bed 
and being summoned by the king of Guardia back in his own time. And then you discover that Luca has invited all the major players from every time period to come and celebrate the future being saved at the Millennial Fair. The Moonlight Parade is finally held in Lean Square, complete with dancing and peace between the humans and the mystics. And then we get a tearful farewell as everyone returns through the portal to their own time. The princess even kisses the frog. But just before the portal closes, Chrono's cat jumps in, followed by his mum. Well, that explains how the cat keeps showing up everywhere, but we might need to go through and save his mum next. Thankfully, we have a fully working Epoch time machine as we didn't crash it into Larvos, so we set off. And then we see the glint of the Epoch in every time period, with everyone remembering us. And with Larvos defeated and everyone's story finished, we have finally finished Chrono Trigger. You can now restart with New Game Plus. You keep all your levels and stats, and you can try for one of the other 14 endings. Total gameplay time, about 20 hours for the complete main ending and all side quests, but the final question remains. Was it actually any good? The truth is that Chrono Trigger isn't perfect, but critiquing Chrono Trigger reminds me of a situation I lived through many years ago. I used to work in retail, and one day the area manager came down to inspect our store. They spent hours looking around and checking everything, but we were thorough. We kept a tidy and well-organized shop. When the report came back, there was one issue. No paper towels in the paper towel dispenser. Now, the paper towel dispenser was in the staff room on the wall unused. It was not in the bathroom. It was used as a coat rack. There wasn't even a sink in the room it was in. So I questioned my manager, why on earth is this an issue when it's not relevant at all? And he explained to me, it's not an issue. But the inspection had to find something no matter how minor. The fact that this was all they could find was a brilliant sign. So while critiquing Chrono Trigger, I had to find faults. That's the purpose of this playthrough. And 20 hours through, I found about four. Left to right screen direction not being respected when you enter the bike race against Johnny. Sometimes NPCs walk over your character sprite and prevent you from moving until they walk off. The one frame active battle issue between selecting a tech and it happening, sometimes meaning enemies move out of range or areas. And Marl's final weapon being given from Frog's area side quest. Four flaws, minor flaws in a 20-hour, 14-ending RPG is insanely good quality. As for the strengths, Chrono Trigger is a time-traveling adventure from humble beginnings to epic conclusion, featuring a cast of characters with history and future, flaws and redemptions all. Every character's story is woven through the fabric of time, and completing their stories is a satisfying journey. The main characters are, without a doubt, Magus and the Frog, and the brilliance is while they're understandably enemies, they're both heroes in their own story. Every character is flawed, but the flaw itself is both born from how they have been brought up and what they've gone through, and then fixed by who that situation has made them become, giving every member of the team a distinct feel and a wonderfully satisfying conclusion. Graphically, it's aged like fine wine because sprites are timeless and style lasts longer than high-quality graphics. The strength of the writing shines, as while having genuinely emotional moments, the serious moments are balanced with enough humour to humanise both the characters and the world. There's storytelling in the text, the environment, the combat, and the music. The battle system is deep without being complex, and mob fights are frequent but quick, and each boss has a unique mechanic to keep it interesting. Longer fights are never too dull, as each move does matter and wrong choices are punished, but never to an unfair degree. The freedom to take on Larvos roughly 10% into the game is a brave decision which was way ahead of its time, and we're still praising games which do this today. And the fantastic pacing means the adventure is always moving forward and never hits a grind wall or an I-don't-know-what-to-do moment. And all of this is set to a wonderful score which I've been listening to for days while writing this video and I'm still not bored of. Chrono Trigger is an excellent example of a game being greater than the sum of its parts, while at the same time each of those individual parts is almost flawless. Chrono Trigger is a 20-hour slice of RPG brilliance. It set the bar for what RPGs could do in 20 hours and still now, 28 years later, remains the measure of what a short to mid-length game can achieve. The few flaws I could find don't take away from the overall experience and shouldn't stop anyone from trying it. So yes, Chrono Trigger was good. It was great. It set the bar so high it is still up there as a game worth replaying and judging modern RPGs by. So to end the review, it's only fair to award Chrono Trigger the highest award possible. Frog. Out of 10. Cheers for watching. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon, Twitch, and YouTube who keep the channel alive and allow me to make these long-form videos. You can support from only £1 a month. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter, and our Discord. And as always, remember...